Welcome to your video guided tour of the Jurassic Park movies. For our returning visitors, you will be familiar with the breathtaking and wondrous experience of the first movie and perhaps some warm feelings of nostalgia for the lost world. Then you'll be reminded of the small glimmer of hope offered by Jurassic World, which is then sadly depleted by the existence of the last two movies. If this is your first time visiting the park, no refunds. Thank you for listening. Dr. Hausenberg will now take over as your personal tour guide through all of these wonderful and godforsaken movies. And remember to add a like down below and watch without ad blockers so that Hausenberg can pay the voice actor he's hired. Wait, you said I was getting paid in advance. Whoa, whoa, what was all that crazy stuff about? Don't know anything about that last part, she said. But what I do know is Jurassic Park and all of the interesting films that came after it. It's going to be a long ride, so let's just crack on, shall we? Welcome to Jurassic Park. Do I dare describe Jurassic Park as a perfect movie? I'm going to be a bold boy and say yes. It's the perfect combination of everything that makes a movie an unforgettable and life-defining experience. The concept, captivating. Every dinosaur fan's dream world brought to life. How'd you do this? I'll show you. The characters and who they chose to play those characters, perfect choices were made. Could have been worse, John. <laughs> a lot. The combination of CGI and practical effects, absolutely breathtaking, and the landmark of cinema history. Boy, my head being right all the time. And the story, nothing like it came before, and in my opinion, nothing like it will ever happen again. Even within its own franchise, they tried, but couldn't quite capture that lightning in the bottle moment again. But we'll come back to that point later. Yeah, that's nice. Gotta go. Of course, those points were just scratching the surface of what makes a movie great. This is just the tip of the crystallized amber iceberg, and I couldn't be happier to give you the full guided tour of everything there is to appreciate about Jurassic Park. The opening title cards, combined with the first of many incredible John Williams scores, is so eerie, you feel like you're stepping into a dark and dangerous forest. The opening shot of this movie also does an amazing job at setting the tone, as we see the park staff looking up nervously into the trees, watching something moving and growling, which is then revealed to be a dinosaur in a cage. This spotlighting and presentation with all this creepy fog is classic Spielberg talent on display. This man right here is Robert Muldoon, a big game hunter from Kenya, currently employed as the park's warden, and he's overseeing the delivery of this dangerous dinosaur. And to show you how dangerous these creatures are, even with all these precautions in place and guns at the ready, they were unable to stop this creature from overpowering them with intelligence, and it eats the gatekeeper. <laughs> We get this excellent camera work, giving us close-up eye contact between the Velociraptor and Robert Muldoon, as he and the other guys ineffectively do all they can to stop this monster's raw strength. Shoot us! Shoot us! What an amazing way to foreshadow the message of this entire movie. The park lawyer is forced to go to a dig site to speak with the foreman about a lawsuit that the park faces for the death of the gatekeeper. And the fact that John Hammond, the park owner, isn't here because he's spending time with his family shows his almost careless regard for formalities and due process, which we'll see more of when we get to know him. The lawyer explains that they're looking for two experts to give their sign off on the park before it opens, so that the insurance companies will agree to give them further financial protection. But the foreman is more interested in this chunk of amber containing more dinosaur DNA. Next, we meet Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler, both paleontologists working on a dig site in Montana, and they gather around a scanner showing the remains of a raptor. Alan describes the many similarities raptors share with birds, which causes this young boy to mock raptors. That doesn't look very scary. <laughs> More like a six foot turkey. This is where Alan's indifference to children and inexperience of being around them is shown by Alan scaring the kid half to death in order to get him to show respect to raptors. And he slashes at you with this six inch retractable claw, like a razor. He slashes at you here or here. 
Also, this speech foreshadows the hunting abilities that the raptors demonstrate later, but I'm keeping this part blurred for now to avoid spoilers. Unexpectedly, a helicopter arrives blowing dust everywhere, potentially setting their progress back, so Alan angrily races inside to see who's arrived. What the hell do you think you're doing in here? We were saving that. But today, I guarantee it. This man is John Hammond, an eccentric billionaire who funds their expeditions from afar. He explains the situation, but remains deliberately vague on the details of his park attractions, insisting instead that they come visit the park and give him the sign-off his insurers need. I like how at first they seem unsure, but Hammond demonstrates that money gets him exactly what he wants by offering to fund their dig for three more years. <laughs> We then cut to a sus looking man carrying a bag and he gets called over to a meeting. You shouldn't use my name. Dodson, Dodson, we've got Dodson here. See, nobody cares. This delightfully chubby fellow is Dennis Nedry, a disgruntled member of the park's IT infrastructure. In his greed for a big payday, he's in a shady deal with Dodson to smuggle out dinosaur DNA. This part where Dodson is showing him how to conceal the DNA has always freaked me out. It's cool to compartmentalize inside. Did you hear that weirdly unnatural squeak? I was confused for the longest time, not knowing if this come from the compressed air inside the can, or whether this noise came from Dennis Nedry, and trust the Jurassic Park fan base to have already done some investigating. Along with this video editor going frame by frame, the foreign dubs for this movie proved that this noise came from Nedry. <laughs> This is the kind of small detail that I'm sure only lifelong Jurassic Park fans like me will care about, but I had to mention it. Hammond flies his special guest to the island, with Hammond's lawyer bringing this quirky man along as his choice of person to sign off on the park. His name is Ian Malcolm, played by the legendary Jeff Goldblum. He's generally regarded as the best or perhaps most memorable character in this movie, which is why he's been in almost every Jurassic Park movie since. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to get used to Dr. Malcolm. It's made obvious why John didn't want him here, as they share a history of disagreements for John Hammond's different projects. They stop bickering as John gives his iconic introduction to the island. There it is. It's such a magical moment that only improves of the context of knowing what's on this mysterious island. Take note of this conversation here, where Hammond's lawyer Donald is determined to keep John's head out of the clouds and focused on taking this investigation seriously. Your investors whom I represent are deeply concerned. 48 hours from now, if they're not convinced, I'm not convinced. I shut you down, John. <laughs> In 48 hours, I'll be accepting your apologies. They arrive in these amazing custom jeeps, and man, if you could see my smile right now. This moment of them pulling up and the camera moving in closer to Dr. Grant's face, with the next cut still holding on his shock and awe, leaves you tingling with suspense before the first reveal of what's in this park. <laughs> and then they ramp up this emotion as John Hammond gives them a formal introduction, the big reveal of the park. Welcome to Jurassic Park. I really could go on to describe every detail of why this scene is absolute perfection. The reactions of each person, including the lawyer who is temporarily dazed into having his head in the clouds alongside John. We're gonna make a fortune with this place. And we have John's expression of tearful pride, the music, the editing, and we have to mention the CGI which was groundbreaking at the time. It's just a privilege to exist at the same time as this movie. John ushers them into the visitor's center so he can give them the same presentation that other visitors are going to experience. This video that he's produced is set up in a way that suggests that he's going to be present for every single presentation, which is the least realistic thing about this dinosaur park. 
The presentation explains how the dinosaurs were made, using blood extracted from a mozzie preserved in amber and spliced with the DNA of frogs. It's a really fun part of the movie that delivers exposition in a very engaging way. And I love this wacky cartoon DNA guy and his stupid little voice. Sometimes, after biting a dinosaur, the mosquito would land on the branch of a tree and get stuck in the sap. And now, we can make a baby dinosaur. The automated tour takes them to a viewing window of the hatchery, but the tour carries on too quickly for these dinosaur experts, who cannot simply move on without seeing more. Uh, can't do that. What? Can they do that? They barge their way into this very important room, just in time to see their first baby dinosaur being hatched. And straight off, Ian Malcolm is concerned about them playing God like this, suggesting that even though the dinosaurs are genetically altered to all be female, science can never fully control nature. You're implying that a group composed entirely of female animals will breed? No, I'm, I'm simply saying that life uh, finds a way. The tone of this movie finally switches from wonderment and awe to deep concern when Dr. Grant learns that the park has velociraptors. Robert Muldoon shares Dr. Grant's level of fearful respect with the added rationale of witnessing firsthand just how deadly smart velociraptors are. The debate goes into full swing by lunchtime, with John Hammond at his wit's end, feeling like everyone in the room is against him. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. You do feel bad for John. I can personally relate to the feeling that people are trying to crush your dreams by laying down cold hard truths and telling him that this idea of his will likely crash and burn. Throughout the whole film, you feel like you're watching an old man's dreams being stripped away, all because he acted too hastily to make it happen in his excitement of discovering the ability to make it happen. That's what makes this film so tragic in my eyes. Sure, the multiple deaths are sad, but nothing hits me in the feels quite like John Hammond's story. Now we have some levity after that soul-crushing conversation, as John's grandkids are here. <laughs> Go away! <laughs> Get we with miss you. This is a rare example of where kids in a blockbuster movie actually add value and purpose to the character arcs, most notably for Alan Grant. Earlier in the movie, they had a playful conversation about having kids, where Dr. Sattler's eager for it to happen, and Dr. Grant isn't so sure. Even though he outwardly resists the idea, he demonstrates throughout the rest of the movie that he'd be a great dad. Small character details like this are largely missing from the later movies. You can really feel the difference. John instructs Samuel Jackson's character, Ray Arnold, to start the self-driving Jeep tour, and even he sounds anxious about doing this. Hold on to your butts. They arrive through the Jurassic Park gates, and you'd expect them to be seeing dinosaurs straight away like you do in a zoo. But instead, right away, we can see a problem, in that these dinosaurs live in very generously spaced enclosures, and so the first dinosaur on their tour, the Dilophosaurus, is nowhere to be seen. Now, now eventually you do plan to have dinosaurs on your, on your dinosaur tour, right? Oh, hello? I really hate that man. John Hammond forgetting the golden rule of zoos is that you need to squeeze these stupid animals into tiny, unnatural spaces so that we humans can gawk at them and bang on the glass loudly to scare them. As the tour continues, John approaches Dennis about some minor coding errors he made, and Dennis pushes back by saying he's not paid enough. Oh, you're right, John. You're absolutely right. You know, everything's my problem. I will not get drawn into another financial debate with you, Dennis. I really will not. During their squabbling, Muldoon tells them to be quiet because the tour is about to enter the T-Rex paddock. But again, it was anticipation for nothing, as the T-Rex is also nowhere to be seen. You'll notice that we're about 50 minutes into the movie, and we've yet to come face to face with any deadly dinosaur. We were teased at the start with the raptor, and the movie continues to keep us waiting, which makes the later scenes when they do appear so much more special. John attempts to lure the Rex out with a goat, while Timmy and sister Lex look on. He's gonna eat the goat? Excellent. What's the matter, kid? You never had lamb chops? I mentioned this goat scene because it leads to a cool jump scare later. Where's the goat? Continuing on, Alan decides to suddenly leave the car when he spots something going on in the fields, with Ellie following him seconds later. They find a sickly triceratops being investigated by a park ranger, and the emotion that overcomes Ellie here is very authentic to me. <laughs> Alan Grant doesn't cry, but his reaction feels equally real to me. God, Ellie, she was my favorite when I was a kid, and now I see she's the most beautiful thing I ever saw. 
To investigate the cause of the Triceratops illness, Ellie says they should find its poo to see what it's been eating. And this next bit is by far the most memed part of the movie. That is one big pile of shit. As John feared, a tropical storm has stayed its course towards the island, so the tour has to be cut short. This storm also changes Dennis Nedry's scheme, as the boat he was going to leave the island on with his stolen DNA is having to leave early. Dennis nervously comes up with an excuse to leave his desk while timing the security system's configuration. Look how these two scenes are edited together. Isn't that just the perfect edit for conveying how Dennis is about to execute his plan along with the thunderclap that tells us this is the start of the disaster element of the movie? Dennis gets to work, stealing the valuable DNA samples from the cold embryo storage. Not sure what a Stegasaurus is, must be a close cousin of the Stegosaurus. With Dennis on his way to the boat, the team start to realise that Dennis has shut down some vital functions of park security, and they can't get the system back online without him, as he initiated a programme to make it this way. Uh, uh, uh. You didn't say the magic word. Please! Uh, uh, uh. God damn it! Hate this hack of crap! Unfortunately for the people who went back to the jeeps and were on their way back to the visitor center, their jeeps have lost power right outside the Rex paddock. And before long, they start hearing the ominous fuds of the Rex's footsteps. And then they notice that the goat is off its chain. Where's the goat? <laughs> this part where we see the Rex testing the fence, seeing it's no longer powered and then popping its big old head up is really awesome. The fact that her first appearance is animatronic rather than CGI is exactly why this moment is timeless. The lawyer freaks out and runs for the toilets, leaving the kids on their own. Now where does he think he's going? When you gotta go, you gotta go. The Rex comes out of its paddock, and I'm just gonna play this part. Boy, do I hate being right all the time. <laughs> Even though this part uses CGI, the rain and darkness covers it up well enough to keep its level of authenticity. The T-Rex rampages. She tries to eat Lex and Timmy in a moment that scared the crap out of me as a kid. And then she eats the lawyer in a part that will always be funny. Alan Grant attempted to lure her away with a flare, which was working out really well. That is until Ian Malcolm decided to try the same thing and he gets chased down and smacked away. With Timmy stuck in the upturned Jeep, Lex and Alan sit as still as they can to not alert the Rex to where they are, going off the theory that the Rex's vision is based on their movement. Which, I don't know if this is based on any real life research, but honestly, who really cares? It makes for a good movie scene. Rex pushes the car around, which forces Alan and Lex to rappel down into the enclosure, even though in a previous shot, it was suggested that the paddock is floor level. But that kind of continuity error doesn't really bother me. I still believe this movie to be perfect. The Jeep gets pushed into a tree, so Alan has to go rescue Timmy. And both of the kid actors here do a terrific job. Lex looks petrified at the idea of being left alone for a minute, and Timmy does a great job at looking like he's in a state of shock after what just happened. We then get this tense scene watching them race to climb down the tree as this heavy ass jeep starts breaking the branches above. Well, we're back in the car again. <laughs> Ray explains that there are over 2 million lines of code in Dennis Nedry's program, meaning there's going to be a long wait to get the park security back online. John pleads with Muldoon to take a gas-powered jeep and rescue his grandkids, with Ellie insisting that she joins him. They find Ian Malcolm injured but alive. The others, however, are nowhere in sight. While resting up, Ian notices the tremors in the puddles, and when they rush back to the jeep, the surprise reveal shows Rexy in pursuit. <laughs> This chase scene is great, with the only nagging detail is me not understanding why Rex wouldn't just bite Ian, as she's clearly close enough to do so. She's somehow able to nudge the car but not take a quick bite. But never mind, they got away. 
Dennis, however, isn't so lucky. He crashed his Jeep and he's stuck on some rocky terrain. And while tying a winch around the tree, he sees that a playful Dilophosaur is investigating him. Dennis attempts to play fetch with it, assuming them to be no smarter than the dog. Stick, stupid! Fetch a stick, boy! Yes! You like your stick? You like it? And no wonder you're extinct. Dennis slips as he tries to get back into the jeep, and then the Dillo reveals its intimidating frills, spitting gooey venom in his face. I recently learned that in real life, the officers didn't have a frill, and they also didn't spit venom. So that's kind of a bummer, but I'm still glad they decided to do this, being one of the most memorable deaths in the whole Jurassic franchise. <laughs> The movie lightens up for a moment, as Alan and the kids watch the Brachiosaurs grazing, high up in the safety of a tree. A nice moment seeing Alan taking on the role as doting protector, who says he will stay up all night if it makes them feel better. We of course have this corny scene where Timmy tells his dinosaur jokes. What do you call a blind dinosaur? I don't know, what do you call a blind dinosaur? Do you think he saw us? <laughs> and the gross out scene where Lex gets sneezed on. <laughs> And this part of the movie was clearly catering towards the kids watching this, but the overall charm it adds to the movie is undeniable. Ellie spots John comfort eating ice cream as he sulks about his dream turning into a nightmare. This conversation is crafted beautifully as we continue to hear John talk about how he can correct his mistakes and he reminisces about his creations in the early days. Ellie, however, wants him to wake up to reality, talking in the here and now, bringing the conversation back to something more important than the hopes and dreams of an old man, the safety of their loved ones who are still very much in danger. When we have control again. You never had control, that's the illusion. I was overwhelmed by the power of this place. I didn't have enough respect for that power, and it's out now. The frustration of this conversation bringing tears to her eyes. This scene serves a humbling reminder how creative ambition to fulfill your self-imposed purpose in life can suck you in to the point of neglecting the people in your life. The next morning, Alan finds a nest with broken eggshells, making Ian Malcolm 100% right about life finding a way. Even though the dinosaurs were genetically modified to be female, they patched in DNA from a frog type that has the ability to change sex. Speaking of Ian Malcolm, here he is in the movie's second biggest meme. This shot adds nothing to the movie, but I guess they figured that the guys watching have their dinosaurs, death and destruction to enjoy, so better throw in something for the ladies to enjoy too. Ooh. With no other option left, John tells Ray to shut off all the power in the park to stop Nedry's program and reboot the system back to normal. Hold on to your butts. The mains power is restored, but the breakers have all tripped, meaning Ray has to go and manually flip them back on. Sounds easy enough, but the breakers are located in the maintenance bunker on the other side of the raptor paddock. Ellie and the others hunker down in the first aid bunker while they wait for Ray to definitely return. Muldoon isn't messing around and won't let Ellie go on her own to check on Ray. Something went wrong. I'm gonna go get the power back on. You can't just stroll down the road. You know? This next moment where we see the raptors have broken out still gives me the chills because we all know what's coming. They can see a path through the jungle to the maintenance bunker, but Muldoon says the game is already over as they're being hunted by the raptors. And like the absolute bro he is, he essentially sacrifices himself to let her make a run for it. He feels somewhat confident that he can get the first shot, but then... <sighs> Clever girl. Ellie makes it to the bunker, but Ray Arnold is nowhere to be seen. As she begins to flip the power switches back on, Alan and the kids are climbing over an electric fence, which just so happens to be the last switch on the panel. Classic movie suspense stuff. Alan urgently calls for Timmy to jump as the warning sirens are sounding. Subverting my expectations the first time watching this, Timmy doesn't jump in time and gets electrocuted. But luckily after a tense minute of no breathing, Alan brings him back to life. Good boy. Good boy. Ellie is celebrating bringing the park back online, but then suddenly... She manages to get away from the raptor for now, and then she thinks she's found Ray alive and well, but nope. Alan takes the kids to rest up in the visitor centre while he finds Ellie, and this starts what is probably most people's favourite part of the movie. Lex starts trembling when she can see a silhouette of a raptor on the other side of the wall. Absolutely terrifying.
They run off to the kitchen to hide, hoping that raptors don't know how to open doors. Oh no. This whole kitchen scene is so well choreographed and tense. On first watch, you really do feel these kids are basically doomed. And perhaps in reality, they should be. But I'm willing to suspend my disbelief, even at the point where Timmy outruns a raptor to lock it in the freezer. <laughs> So yeah, they manage to get out, and the other raptor generously gives them some time before running after them. Back with Ellie and Alan, they run off to the control room where Alan yells at them to enable the door locks. Boot up the door locks. It was established earlier that Lex is a quote-unquote hacker because this is a 90s movie where anyone remotely computer literate was labelled as a nerdy hacker. While the grown-ups struggle with the door, Timmy flaps about like an injured pigeon and Lex gets to work hacking the system so they can get the security door back online. And when everything is back online, they phone John to tell him the good news. But it's not over yet. <laughs> Gonna come through the glass! They manage to escape into the lobby, but the raptors are still on them. It looks like certain death, but then the T-Rex, who made no sound on the approach, crashes in and takes on the raptors. I know it looks incredibly silly, but you can't deny the cheesy awesomeness as the T-Rex wins and the banner falls down in front of him. John Hammond finally accepts defeat, and it makes me tear up a bit as he's ushered into the helicopter, with him walking away from the helicopter momentarily to remind you that this island was his pride and joy, and this is a time of great loss for him, leaving him in just as much shock as everyone else. He stares mournfully at his crystallized amber while the piano rendition of the Jurassic Park theme plays. Ellie and Alan share loving smiles, seeing him transformed into a surrogate father to these kids. And then they fly off into the sunset. What an amazing movie. Hopefully you can see why I spent longer than usual talking about it. And if not, I'm sure the movies to come will prove why it's necessary to praise this one so much. The Lost World's biggest problem is the story. It's nowhere near as thought-provoking or as neatly packaged as Jurassic Park, especially when the movie gets to around the hour and a half mark, where it feels like the story takes an abrupt left turn, away from all of the character arcs and subtext, turning to purely focus on big bad boy dinosaur action fun times. With that said, I still really like this movie. Where Jurassic Park is a 10 out of 10, The Lost World is a respectable 7 out of 10 in my books. So please bear in mind that I'm going to try and balance out my critique by also talking about the things I really liked. Because in the moments when this movie does hit, it hits extremely well. So, what is The Lost World and why is it no longer lost? The Lost World is a super secret island called Isla Sauna, where John Hammond and his company InGen bred the dinosaurs before taking them to Jurassic Park. Only problem is, keeping this island a secret was never going to last when you have adventurous posh families sailing around, looking for a nice place to feed their children to wild animals. Kathy? This opening sets up the best transition in cinema history. Ian Malcolm lives a life of being recognised as the guy from TV after he gave some statements about the events of Jurassic Park that contradict the protective statements given by InGen. I believed you. Now I know this is a small insignificant detail, but when mimicking the jaws of a creature biting down, you would instinctively position your fingers in the correct position for the teeth, with the top and bottom set facing each other. Yet this guy has two top sets of teeth clashing against each other. Even a toddler knows the right way to mimic a dinosaur going rah with its hands. Has anyone else picked up on this, or is it just me being weird? Probably just me, right? Let's just move on, shall we? Ian arrives at John's mansion for a meeting with him, and I completely forgot that we get a cameo from the Jurassic Park kids. Oh my Hello, God. Hello, Dr. Malcolm. Kids. Yes. It's so great to see you. It's so great to see you. The actor who played Tim said this cameo paid for his college tuition, which isn't too bad for half a day's work. That was a nice surprise to be included in the cameo of Lost World and show up there with, with Joey and just make our appearance. I basically got my college tuition paid for 
because of that movie. And so it was this like little special gift kind of that I was given. This cameo is an example of why buying physical copies of movies is important for appreciating film. Like I said before, I want to make sure I'm being as fair as I can be to the sequels in this franchise. And showing you lovely stories like this from the bonus material helps us to appreciate the real people behind this Hollywood product. And I'll be showing some production material as we go along to appreciate the impressive technical feats where they deserve to be highlighted. Ian and the new CEO of InGen, Peter Ludlow, immediately start butting heads over the media storm they generated by giving different versions of what happened in Jurassic Park. You can convince the Washington Post and the Skeptical Inquirer of whatever you want, but I was there, I know what happened, and so do you. Even though Ian feels morally victorious in his mission to blow whistles, Peter reminds him that money is a far greater power than the truth. Careful. This suit costs more than your education. John tells Ian that some InGen board members want to sell dinosaurs in order to stop them going bankrupt, using the incident of the young British girl to take control of InGen away from John as they face yet another lawsuit. Now the reason Ian is here is because John wants him to go to the island and be a key witness to the dinosaur's well-being so he can then convince the public to give the island a protected status. And because Ian isn't a moron, he says bugger off, I'm not going to an island filled with dinosaurs again, and he demands to know the names of the other people John paid to go and it's here that it's revealed that one of the people is Ian's girlfriend. So guess who's going to the island? You guessed it, it's Vince Vaughn. And yeah, of course Ian's here too. Vince is a videographer and a member of Greenpeace. Not because he loves his planet, but because he loves women. 80% female Greenpeace. Thanks. Noble. Yeah. Only a criminally desperate man would throw paint on Price's artwork just for a chance at landing some unwashed puss. The other guy on the scene here is Eddie, a field equipment specialist. Not much to be said about this character, he's just kind of a chill guy. I sure hope nothing terrible happens to him later. <laughs> Ian breaks the news to his daughter from a previous marriage that he's going away for a while, and she gets all pissy about it, saying he never spends any time with her. You like to have kids, but you just don't want to be with them, do you? Hey, I'm not the one who uh, dumped you here and split for Paris, so don't take it out on me. If you're sitting there thinking this part of the story isn't as exciting as Jurassic Park was, well, all I can say is... You're right, you're absolutely right. As a kid, I was really jealous that Kelly got to wander around this high-tech trailer. Ah, I'm not gonna BS you, I'm still jealous. This trailer is an iconic set piece in the film, and we'll see why later. We get a fairly cliche but albeit cool transition of Kelly looking at the map of the place we cut to. And you can't help but love the fact that these islands are called Las Cinco Muertes, which translates to the five deaths. Meaning that John Hammond willingly built his park and site B on islands that come with a warning label. They use the GPS tracker to find Sarah's phone and find that she's not there with it. So they call out for her before being rudely interrupted by some stegosaurs. <laughs> What makes the inclusion of Stegosaurus in this scene particularly cool is that Steven Spielberg did so in response to some fan mail he got from a kid, asking to see their favourite dinosaur on screen. We've got the Stegosaurus by popular demand, by the way. Really? Yeah. Because of the fan mail for the first movie, so many kids said, I wish you had a Stegosaurus. Nick goes in for a better camera angle, and right next to him is Sarah. Hey, Nick! <laughs> Sarah's really unfazed by Ian's concern for her being here, and instead is dizzy with anticipation about seeing more dinosaurs. I like how not even his girlfriend took his first-hand accounts from Jurassic Park as any kind of deterrent from coming here. Sarah goes into pet baby Stego, and who can blame her? I'd trade in my cat for a baby Stego. Oh, I'm only kidding, Willow. I'd never trade you in. Her camera goes berserk, and so does the baby Stego, putting Mama Bear in protective mode. Sarah then goes on a rant about their purpose here, and I think she's suffering from short-term memory loss. I don't like that. Dinosaurs can pick up scents from miles away. We're here to observe and document, not interact. Uh. We're here to observe and document, not interact. Uh. They rush to base camp to put out a fire and find that Kelly snuck on board and was cooking for them. So make that two people in Ian's life who didn't take his experience seriously. 
We get some more insight into Ian's personal life, as Sarah explains how she feels abandoned by him when she's needed him before, which echoes how Kelly feels. Or, or why not rescue me from that dinner with your parents that you never showed up for? Why not rescue me when I really need it? Actually, be there. So in fairness, it's now understandable why Sarah felt she wasn't too important to him. They hear some rumbling from above and see the engine are flying a load of heavy duty vehicles in, suggesting that Hammond sent in another team for some reason. But it's soon apparent this new team is here against Hammond's wishes, as they came here to hunt down and capture dinosaurs. <laughs> This sequence introduces us to the best actor in this movie, in my opinion, and he's definitely in the top tier of characters in this entire franchise. His name is Roland Tembo, a big game hunter played by the late actor Pete Postlethwaite. <laughs> I won't be saying that twice. All of his dialogue is delivered with a stamp of authority, and he's leading this cavalry with a no-nonsense attitude. There are two conditions. Firstly, I'm in charge, and when I'm not around, Dieter is. All you need to do is sign the checks, tell us we're doing a good job, and open your case of scotch when we have a good day. The next line he says is iconic Roland dialogue, and I wish I could play the entire thing, but it's over 10 seconds long, meaning YouTube will flag it for copyright. But trust me, it's worth a watch. But I've been on too many safaris with rich dentists to listen to any more suicidal ideas. Okay. Okay. This guy here, Robert Burke, is the dinosaur fact man, and I find it funny that he's given a briefing about the Pachycephalosaurus at the same time as they're trying to deal with it. When it lowers its head, its neck lines up directly with its backbone which is perfect for absorbing impact. Wouldn't you prepare the team way ahead of schedule? <laughs> you probably had a few hours on the flight over here to give everyone a rundown, right? Why give out this information now? Dieter Stark, who I'm just going to call Sparky because of this moment, immediately makes himself look like a douche for being mean to this inquisitive little Pompey. He'll get his comeuppance soon enough. Roland spots a single giant footprint and gets Burke to confirm that it's a Rex print. And so off he goes on the hunt with this guy, who looks way too similar to Ludlow for my liking. So if I do mix them up, please don't be upset with Papa Hausenberg. I'm trying my best. Speaking of terrifyingly large daddies, Roland comes up with a plan to lure the male Rex away from the nest by kidnapping the cub. Is a baby dinosaur called a cub? Okay, Google tells me they're called hatchlings, but I don't like that. I'm just going to keep calling them cubs. It's way cuter. So, let's move on to some fun time action. Ludlow is giving a live streamed pitch to investors for a new version of Jurassic Park. This time it's going to be safely located in San Diego, rather than Satan's spit bucket, or whatever these islands were called. During this sales pitch, Sarah and Nick are going around unbolting the cages to all the dinosaurs, and this live stream meeting gets obliterated by a trike. <laughs> While editing this part, I come across this small little goof. Look at the uh, cameraman as the Triceratops comes through the tent. You see there's a wire that's coming uh, from the back of the uh, stuntman here. And watch <laughs> watch what happens as the trike comes through. The, the wire pulls him, <laughs> yanks him out of the way, which I wouldn't have noticed if it wasn't for these other two here who are just like moving normally. But for whatever reason, the uh, whoever choreographed this scene, I'm assuming Steven Spielberg, uh, decided have one guy just yank, get yeeted out of existence. <laughs> it's, it's a fun little goof. A flaming car is somehow sent as high as a tree, causing Roland and RJ to bail out. Upon discovering the cut padlocks, we get another great line delivery from Roland. What's going on? Isn't it obvious? We're not alone on this island. Nick and Sarah rescue the cub and bring it back to the trailer so they can perform first aid. And this thing is wailing like an N64 Mario falling to his death. <laughs> Ian tries to talk some sense into them, like that's ever worked before. And he's also trying the radio for a rescue boat, but just getting a confused, angry Latina on the other end. Enrique, No, no, not Enrique. It's Ian. Malcolm, are you on the boat? Enrique? No, is this the boat? No, no, a lady. Enough. Wrong frequency. Kelly starts freaking out and says she wants to go somewhere out of reach of the T-Rex. Luckily, Eddie has a machine called a high hide because it's high and you hide. And you're high while you're hiding. <laughs> Bruh. 
I don't understand how this machine is supposed to work. It appears to be a metal cable wrapped over a branch with a cage attached to it, and they use a winch to take it up and down. But I've got some questions. Like, how do you pre-test the strength of a branch that's holding you up there? Wouldn't it instead just be safer to attach a ladder to a tree? And then all you have to do is climb up it and you're safe. Roland had the right idea with this type of platform, but those safety concerns will have to wait for now, as an angry Rex has found its empty nest. <laughs> Ian calls ahead to warn them, but they don't answer. So he puts on his hero cape and descends to the floor. And when he gets to the trailer, we get the absolute best part of this movie. Mummy's very angry. Mummy and Daddy don't take too kindly to their kid being napped. And Sarah comes out with some stupidly obvious dialogue to set up a comedy line for Ian. They came for their infants. Let's not disappoint them. Luckily, everything else about this scene is awesome. I'm really glad they used the animatronic Rexes in the close-up shots. Even Baby Rex is a cool animatronic, which apparently was super complicated to control. That was a difficult one because Vince Vaughn had to actually be holding it while it was moving and acting and everything. So we had to hide this huge umbilical that was operated by puppeteers. It's a common tactic in movie making, but then making it rain super heavy really sets the tone well. And I like the setup of having a phone either side, so we can switch between the trailer and the high hide, where Eddie can communicate the information that the Rexes are returning to the jungle. But then Sarah goes on to explain that she now understands parental instinct. But Ian, an actual parent, knows from experience that Rexy ain't gonna let this slide. Hang on, this is gonna be bad. The Rexes begin pushing the trader off the cliff, and it's such an exciting scene, especially when Sarah falls down onto the window and it begins to crack. I don't know why the Rexes gave up pushing the trailer before the task was complete. Maybe their comically little arms got tired. I don't know. But yeah, the sound of the glass cracking, the genuine sound of fear in her cries. God. Oh God, please. It's all great cinema. Heads up! Production-wise, they made a real mountainside using a car park and combined this practical set with CGI, with the final product looking pretty damn great in my opinion. Like I hinted before, this is the kind of stuff I'll remind myself of before being too harsh about these Jurassic movies, because I always want to be as fair as possible. Having said that, this next bit of dialogue when Eddie comes to the rescue is so dumb. What do you need? We need rope. Rope? What, do anything else? Yeah. Three double cheeseburgers with everything. No onions on mine. Yeah, sure, it's funny, but you're a sneeze away from fully sending this trailer down the cliff. You might not want to be playing around with your limited time. Eddie secures a rope for them to climb, but the trailer begins slipping in the mud, so he hooks the trailer to his Jeep and starts tugging away with the fury of a lonely Kuma. Determined to complete the mission, even when the Rexes come back for a second time, the trailer comes back a little thanks to his efforts, but poor Eddie gets tossed in the air and pulled apart like a Christmas cracker. The trailer goes down, keeping our heroes perfectly in the center so they conveniently don't get clipped. Even more fortunate, Roland and his crew have arrived on the scene to help them up. See, if they were pure villains, they would have cut the rope in revenge for what they did earlier. But they're simply people with different values in life, by placing no value on animal lives beyond what they can sell them for. Hell, I'm not complaining. I picked up a sweet deal on a baby Rex's head. <sighs> I can still smell the mother's tears. The two groups immediately clash over their differences, but Sarah's quick to alert them to the possibility that the Rexes will likely consider this area a new territory, as the scent of their baby is still here. <sighs> Ludlow says they need to make their way to the communication centre to call in the helicopters, but the problem is the communication centre is where the Velociraptors are. Why they didn't build such an important place on the outer parts of the island, where all the friendly herbivores are, mystifies me. But this is a movie, and we need a challenge to face, so... Right, this is all very thrilling, but I say we should push on to the village. Roland puts forward a strategic plan, and coldly describes how the T-Rex won't be hungry now, so won't be looking to feed again for a while, giving them a head start. I assume you're talking about Eddie. You might show a little respect. The man saved our lives by giving his... Then his troubles are over. My point is the predators don't hunt when they're not hungry. They take a five minute break deep in the forest, and Sparky wanders off to take a piss. But he doesn't just choose to go in some trees nearby like a sensible person. He goes way too deep. 
which maybe you'd understand if he had embarrassingly potent diarrhea or something. But the man's just taken a quick leak. Why not just pee next to your guy friend? He doesn't care. He might even be into it. I'm not gonna judge. Sparky hears a tiny little dinosaur chirping and decides that's reason enough to panic and go searching for it. He gives it another little zap for sneaking up on him. And now the idiot's got himself lost in the woods. Hey, Carter! I got turned around in here! He slips down into the shallow stream and gets jumped by a gang of compies. <laughs> He wins the initial struggle, but then as he goes to run away, he gets jumped on again and killed out of view. I actually quite liked this death scene. It's cool to have a different kind of dinosaur posing an unexpected threat. It's a shame we don't get to see more compi action in the film, but luckily the CGI studio behind the compi models made this tribute video to thank Steven Spielberg. It's called the Compi Dance Number, and I'll show it to you so we can enjoy the compies a bit more. Okay, I'm done enjoying them now. Later that night, the group takes a few hours to sleep, and as Ian is keeping watch, he notices some very familiar tremors. Sarah hears it too, and shudders at the realisation that her jacket is covered in the baby Rex's blood. Normally, I would let this slide as an oopsie doopsie moment, but less than 24 hours ago, she was talking about how powerful a T-Rex's olfactory range is, and she even mentions that the baby Rex blood on her shirt isn't drying, due to the humidity in the air, so it seems a little silly that that Sarah as an expert would overlook this detail. Aside from that, I really enjoyed the suspense of this scene. The others in the camp wake up when one guy starts screaming at it, and the Rex starts chasing them all down this ravine. We get a moment of comedy when the Rex corners them into a waterfall, and a snake slivers into Burke's shirt. Wow, that's some juicy apple he bit into. Roland stays behind to shoot a trank dart into a Rex, which might appear to be a heroic act, but let's not forget what he's on this island for. The action keeps going as they venture into the long grass, completely ignoring RJ's advice. Don't go into the long grass! I'm glad they chose to ignore it, because I love this aerial shot, showing the raptors making a beeline to hunt them down. They start getting picked off one by one, and it's very satisfying. There is, however, one confusing part. So he was running with the pack, and then he turns around and starts screaming before the raptor has even jumped. And he did all this before he could even see where the raptor was. <laughs> this was sloppier than a handjob from a walrus. Our main group, the ones we actually care about, follow just behind the sounds of screaming and hungry raptors. They run as fast as they can towards the communication centre, and by some miracle they make it, with only a slight sprain sustained to Ian's ankle. Vince Vaughn continues on, entering the abandoned communication centre, a set design which has a lot of visual appeal for me, as I love the abandoned aesthetic. The eerie stillness of everything sparks the imagination to wonder what this place looked like when it was fully operational. If I didn't feel so icky towards radiation, I'd love to visit Pipriat, the city that was abandoned after the nuclear meltdown. Vince manages to get through to the rescue team, essentially saving their lives. I know it seemed mean-spirited to just call his character Vince Vaughn through this recap, but I actually think he's a decent character. And this heroic act is proof that Nick Van Owen deserves his name to be spoken. When Ian and the others catch up to Nick, they start calling out for him, with Ian doing the same thing he teased Nick for doing at the start of the film. Nick! Nick Van Owen! Sarah Harding! How many Sarahs do you think are on this island? Sarah! Sarah! This may have been an intentional joke. Either way, I found it funny. This next part of the movie, when the raptors attack, is half cool, half stupid. Some of this choreography makes no sense. <laughs> like, why are you running away from the raptor, only to then circle back round towards it? 
Ah, who could have foreseen this happening? I can't believe he saw us. A cool bit of choreography is when the raptor's facing off against Ian in the petrol station. <laughs> and then we're back to the bad stuff again. <laughs> With a scene that everyone craps on. And I'm about to pull my pants down and crap on it too. Kelly uses her gymnastic skills to boot a raptor through a wall and onto a spike down below. Thirteen-year-old girl, fully grown raptor, somehow has the equivalence of a rabbit being hit by a Volvo. <laughs> they get to the safety of the chopper, and as they fly away, they see Roland has his prize Rex in a cage. So Roland has what he came for, but he's now realised the cost of chasing this dream. He's lost many men on this expedition, and he leaves with this sobering line of dialogue when Ludlow offers him a job looking after the Rex. No, thank you. I believe I've spent enough time in the company of death. This kind of feels like the end of the movie, right? Nope. We've got something big happening next. Ludlow's holding a live press conference to welcome the Rex to San Diego. It's currently on a cargo ship about to arrive at shore. But then Ludlow gets word that not only is the ship early, it's travelling at a concerning speed and there's no response from the crew. This moment where the ship emerges from the darkness is so unsettling. I love it. And this unsettled feeling carries on as they board the ship to see what's going on, finding no one on the top deck. But there is a severed hand which is still holding on to this button. Correction, this hand isn't severed. I was thinking of the hand holding the steering wheel, which is severed. And when this button gets released, boom, Rex in the big city moment. <laughs> This T-Rex roaring at the city of San Diego is iconic. Say what you want about this movie, but this is cinema history we're witnessing. Although this moment is preceded by something that's always bugged me. See if you can spot it. How is no one in this hut reacting to this giant dinosaur stomping around outside? No one's even looking out the window. <laughs> How can they be completely oblivious to what's happening? I have to confess, I do enjoy this dino in the big city part of the film, but I do recognise that it's mostly for nostalgic reasons. The scene where this kid tells his parents that there's a dinosaur in their garden has that classic Spielberg feel to it. It's all good fun to watch, and I simply can't deny that I'm enjoying watching this again. Thinking with my critical hat on though, this part of the movie does feel like it's stretching out the story, just so they can add in some blockbuster type action. Remember that with the first movie, we had the amazing storylines of a select few characters, whose stories all intertwined with John Hammond chasing a dream. The dinosaur parts worked alongside the story in a neatly packaged screenplay. With The Lost World, we almost achieved that, with Ian struggling to be a responsible father and a supportive life partner for Sarah. And we could have had a cool moment where he realises that his hectic lifestyle needs to settle down, and he reprioritises his family time over dinosaur time. Roland had a good story arc, but I still feel like that could have been extended out a bit to demonstrate his emotional journey, rather than just cutting from him being a cold hunter to suddenly being a man who's humbled by his experiences. But that gets all left behind so we can have a cool Rex in the Big City sequence. Hopefully you get where I'm coming from, but remember this is just my opinion I'm expressing here, and I welcome you to leave your disagreements in the comments. Ian and Sarah locate the cub that was also brought back, and they take it to the cargo ship to lure Daddy back to the place where he was being held before. And because Ludlow is a crazy man, he decides to try and get Baby Rex back out of there because he loves money and the Baby Rex is worth a lot of it. But Big Daddy shows up and feeds Ludlow to his young one. <laughs> With the Rex in position, Sarah tranquilizes it back to sleep, and the day is saved. 
We get a sweet moment seeing Sarah, Kelly and Ian all sleeping on the sofa in the safety of their home. And this moment of calm is accompanied by John Hammond giving a speech on TV about how they should leave the dinosaurs alone in their new habitat. These creatures require our absence to survive, not our help. Okay, so that wasn't a perfect film, but at times it was still pretty good. And now we come to a film that I don't believe I can praise in any way. Let's see, shall we? Jurassic Park 3. It's not a bad movie, it's an okay movie, with a few good moments and a few laughable strange choice moments. <laughs> It's like if some unhinged man ordered a Five Guys milkshake and decided to ask for a combination of flavours that don't work well together. Let's say, for example, he orders a strawberry, peanut butter, and throw in some bacon bits in your milkshake. That would perfectly represent the flavours of Jurassic Park 3. The few moments where we see decent animatronics at work are the strawberry part, with strawberry being an established and successful flavour of the movie. Then you come across some CGI peanut butter, which is like, yeah, I can appreciate peanut butter, but you clearly didn't invest in a high quality peanut butter. Maybe you're still able to stomach this milkshake, but then you start choking on some unexpected raptor bacon bits. Alan. Wait, 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 what is this? This doesn't belong in this already questionable milkshake. I ended up finishing this milkshake, even though it was kind of weird. And if you gave it to me again, I'd probably still consume it. Which proves how clever this comparison was, and how smart I am. Would a person who isn't smart pay 5 65 for a milkshake that's bad tasting, and gives you explosive diarrhea? Yeah, checkmate brainlets. It's worth bearing in mind that for this film, Steven Spielberg stepped away from being a director to let his friend Joe Johnston take the reins. Steven was still the executive producer, so he didn't relinquish complete control. The biggest and most obvious change was to the writing staff, who between them didn't have many writing titles under their belt, with one guy having written nothing before this. In their defence, writing a follow-up to a story that feels like it's already reached its conclusion is a tough challenge for even the most seasoned of writers, so I'll give the movie some leeway as we continue with the recap. We're back on Isla Sauna, Site B. Some kid called Eric and his weird stepdad are parasailing around the islands trying to capture some dinosaurs on film. See anything yet? But then the boat they're tethered to starts jolting around, and they can't see what's causing this turbulence due to this patch of fog. When the fog clears, the captain and the crew are missing, and the boat is all tore up with these mysterious claw marks. Oh my! They cut the rope, and with no other choice, they glide towards the island. It's gonna be okay, bud. We cut to Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler. This iconic duo appear to be in a loving relationship with two kids. As in, they're in love and they have two kids. Not that they're in love with kids. <laughs> but as it turns out, Alan Grant is just visiting. Ellie has a new man, and he's the daddy of the two kids. I've seen some people voicing their disapproval of Ellie and Grant not being a couple, saying that it invalidates the romance they had in the first movie. But I'm inclined to disagree. I think it's cool to show that not every relationship works out, because that's just a reflection of real life. The connection they shared in the first movie is still valid, but it's a chapter in their life that they've moved on from, and it's not like the movie dismisses their connection, as we can see that a small flame still burns between them, as they exchange some looks and a long goodbye with each other. You're still the best. I mean that. The last of my breed. Alan appears at a seminar talking about the behaviour theories of velociraptors, but the audience only seems interested in asking questions about what happened at Jurassic Park. Does anyone have a question that does not relate to Jurassic Park? Or the incident in San Diego, which I did not witness. Alan is firm in his belief that studying fossil records provides more accurate data than what can be obtained from resurrected dinosaurs living in a controlled and unnatural environment. The audience, however, are clearly more excited about the unnatural method. They ask him if he would be willing to go back to Site B for studies. No force on earth or heaven could get me on that island. You keep telling yourself that, Alan. Alan! 
Alan meets with one of his understudies, Billy, to share the unfortunate news that the seminar didn't go great, and this will greatly impact their financial support. But Billy's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Want to see something cool? I 3D printed the vocal chamber of a Velociraptor. Yeah, you know this is going to come into play later. Interrupting their fun, a man called Paul Kirby enters the tent. Paul comes across like a wealthy businessman and claims to be a big fan of Dr. Grant's work. He then invites him out to dinner to discuss a proposition and Billy inserts himself into the invitation to make it happen. This is a good move on his part, smelling the potential funding that Mr. Kirby might send their way. Mr. Kirby and his wife Amanda bang on about their adventures across the globe, climbing the tallest mountain, going down the Nile, putting their hand up to make it look like they're propping up the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Yeah, they look like the kind of annoying people that would do that, and then post that picture on Facebook where their friends and family like it out of pity, all the while secretly cringing at how unoriginal they are. Well, anyway, the Kirbys bring out a blank checkbook and say they're willing to pay any amount to have Alan as their personal tour guide for their most exciting and unique adventure yet. A selfie next to the Eiffel Tower. I mean, flying over Isla Sauna, as they have special permission to fly in this restricted airspace. In the plane, Billy mentions that his bag is a lucky bag, just like Sarah Harding had a lucky bag. Your lucky pack. Couldn't you afford a better bag? No way. This one's lucky. I don't know if this was an intentional callback or just poorly researched writing, but repeating this gimmick feels lazy. Alan dozes off on the flight and starts dreaming, and this is where we get the hilarious out of place raptor moment. Alan! Uh. Alan! Wake up! I'm almost there. I remember everyone losing their minds in the cinema when we first saw this. There was a look of collective amusement across the audience, making this an unforgettable moment. To its credit, I think the idea was that this was supposed to represent Alan's uncertainty about the trip, with his nervousness about being near dinosaurs again. Maybe if they switched out the human voice for a raptor noise, this wouldn't have come across so goofy. Alan wakes to see that they're now flying close enough to the island to start giving his tour, but immediately he notices that Kirby and his wife don't seem all that interested, and they start talking about landing the plane. We have a landing strip up ahead, you want me to put it no, out? No, no, I told you, I'm gonna circle first, see the whole island. What do you mean set it down? You can't land here, what are hold you talking on, about? Hold on. Alan gets knocked out for protesting, and awakes to the sound of Amanda calling out someone's name on a megaphone. Outside, Alan urges them all to get back on the plane, and for Amanda to stop advertising their arrival to the hungry dinosaurs. It's a bad idea! What's a bad idea? They all rush back onto the plane, but one guy doesn't make it back, and begs for them to stop and let him on. But it's too late for this guy, and it's also too late for everyone else, as a Spinosaurus clips him out of the air. The following scene is one I quite like. We get an animatronic Spino trying to reach into the plane and scoop out the yummy humans like pick and mix. It manages to grab one of the pilots, and then it starts rolling the cabin around like a dog playing with one of those treat dispenser toys. And honestly speaking, this camera work for the rolling close-up shots and the use of dummies in place of actors makes for a pretty convincing scene. <laughs> They get past the Spino as it digs into the plane, and it chases them across the jungle clearing. <laughs> I don't want to say the CGI is bad or anything, but for shots like this, the animatronic would have been a better choice. They think they're in the clear, but then they stumble across this Rex nest. Alan. Rexy then chases them into the path of the Spino, which causes these two titans to enter a deathmatch. <laughs> I like the idea of the bigger, scarier looking dinosaur taking the crown as the main badass dinosaur of the movie. Alan punches Kirby into a tree and demands to know why they really brought him here, and it turns out these two are Eric's parents, who mistakenly thought that Alan had been to this island before. Alan turns off his anger towards them in the grim realisation that it doesn't really matter, as they are all likely going to die.
As they try to recover their belongings from the plane, the film attempts to make you feel the rekindling connection between Kirby and Amanda, but it never really pays off in a meaningful way. And right now, we kind of don't want them to be happy, considering that they're directly responsible for Alan Grant's potential death. It would have been cool if at the end of the movie, Kirby sells his business to spend more time with the family, and then he sends the money to Alan Grant's organisation as an apology. That would have made for an experience where we see Kirby redeem his character in a meaningful way. I realise I just spoilt the reveal of their son still being alive, but come on, there's no way anyone wasn't expecting him to still be alive. When they see Kirby struggling to put on his backpack, they suspect that he might not be the adventurer he made out to be. Mr. Kirby, tell me, when you climbed K2, did you base camp at 25 or 30,000 feet? 30,000 feet. We're, we're pretty close to the top. You're about a thousand feet above it, actually. No, no, that's a common mistake. Also, he's no fat cat business tycoon. He owns a kitchen slash bathroom supply store. And it's super funny that he offers Alan a new kitchen in place of cashing that check he wrote. Here we are in the worst place in the world. We're not even being paid. With a stroke of luck, they find Eric's parachute and also his camcorder. As they bring the parachute down, a spooky, scary skeleton slips down, causing Amanda to scream and thrash about, like she's got a remote pleasure egg jammed up her butt. Okay, you're free. You're free. Honestly, I didn't even need to make that joke. Her flailing around like this is funny enough on its own. Okay, okay, you're free. You're free. Speaking of unnecessary jokes, they find an old InGen building where they believe their son Eric could be taking shelter. And when they come across some vending machines, Kirby starts rooting around in his pockets for change. I got a buck. I got a buck ten. Got some this would have been funny if it wasn't for the painfully obvious fact that these vending machines haven't been receiving power for some time. Again, it's just... I really don't want to be mean to the writers, but come on, really? It was established mere moments ago that the power to this building is out, as we saw Amanda test out the telephone. And overall, it's just common sense, really. I mean, look at this place. <laughs> The one redeeming element of this is seeing the Velociraptor silhouette whip past the window, giving us some anticipation of what's to come. But the film kind of ruins this too with this stupid jump scare. <laughs> Oh god, this isn't how intelligent animals behave. They're not aware that they're being filmed for a horror scene. The raptors chase them across the building, and the humans manage to trap one behind the door. Oh my god. He's calling for help. I like the idea of the raptors' communication being presented as a language that we can try and follow along with. And if it wasn't for this stupid jump scare moment, I'd have said the raptors were pretty great in this movie. Nowhere near as great as the first, but we've got to give them credit for trying something new. They get chased back into the jungle, and the guy called Judeski gets picked off from the group. Kind of a shame, he seemed like a cool guy. He said we needed someone who'd been on the island before. Yes, but I did not tell you to kidnap somebody. The raptors cleverly keep him alive so they can bait in the others to try and help. But when that trap fails, they break his neck and move on. Alan gets snuck up on by a raptor before being surrounded by the others. But then a smoke grenade is launched in by a small person covered in camo stuff. They lead Alan to the safety of an old truck. And oh my god, it's Eric. I cannot believe he's alive. I am shaking and also crying right now. I find his lack of reaction to the idea that he might be saved from the island a little bit odd, but I'll let it slide because of how cool this set piece is. He's been surviving in this half-submerged truck in the middle of this swamp area living off tinned food. All of this has a post-apocalyptic aesthetic to it that I absolutely love. There are many questions we could ask about how he was able to survive like this, and when Dr. Grant finds a jar of dinosaur piss, he has a question of his own. This is T-Rex P. You don't want to know. Uh, yeah, but we do need to know, though. As the evening goes on and Billy continues calling for Alan, the Kirbys talk about their admiration for each other while they both feel guilty for this situation. But like I said before, these two never redeem their actions towards Alan, so we still kind of don't care about them. Before we move on to the moment where Eric reunites with his family, I feel it's important to give some credit to the set design, as they built an entire forest inside a studio, and they made it look as if the forest runs really deep, with some clever lighting choices to deliver the illusion. It was an optical illusion, even when you stood there 
and looked at the jungle. It looked like it was much deeper than it was. So, how does Eric find his family? Well, he can hear his dad's iconic ringtone going off in the distance. Mom, Dad! I knew it! It's a lovely moment, so I've got to admit I felt warm inside. And it's probably because I can relate to growing up with parents who split. A pretty common situation that a lot of people can relate to. Even though they likely split for good reasons, as a kid it's hard for you to understand. And you want nothing more than to experience this moment right here, being all back together again. Let's get back to the funny stuff. Mr. Kirby explains that he hasn't had his cell phone since the plane crash. He lent it to the pilot guy who got eaten. He must have had it when he... <laughs> this is so goofy, but it's so iconic in the Jurassic Park franchise. I simply can't help but look forward to it each time. The Spino chases them, but they make it through this perfectly human-sized hole in the fence. And so it appears that the Spino gives up. But then... They make a beeline for this hut on the edge of a cliff. And for some reason, this Spino is unable to bust down the doors. <laughs> Like we didn't just see it a moment ago smash through this giant steel fence. It's a detail I refuse to let go of. Billy's insistent that Dr. Grant gives him his bag back. And it's revealed that in the scene earlier on, he stole some raptor eggs. He rationalises it by saying that these two eggs would make them enough money to fund their dig site for a very long time. Dr. Grant is very disappointed in him and delivers this cold jab. As far as I'm concerned, you're no better than the people that built this place. As he's about to drop the eggs out the window, he realises that the raptors have been chasing them this whole time because they have the eggs. What if they catch us with them? What if they catch us without them? The staircase in this building leads down to a mysterious platform with extremely thick fog shrouding the air, making it almost impossible to see the path ahead on this rickety bridge. Wisely, they choose to go one by one so the bridge doesn't collapse, and also because it makes for a cool suspense scene. What is it? It's a birdcage. Ah! This is easily my favourite winged dinosaur moment in the whole franchise. Eric is dropped down into the Pteranodon nest, and Billy attempts to redeem himself by parachuting from a very high platform. He manages to rescue Eric as he gets low enough to drop him safely into the water, but unfortunately he gets snagged on the rocks, and the Pteranodons are swooping in for the kill. Oh man, <laughs> I'm really tired of saying Pteranodons. I'm switching up the name to Angry Flappers. So Billy cuts his line and lands in the water, but the Angry Flappers don't let up, and the others watch him get pecked up real bad as the current takes him away. Oh yeah, the rest of the gang are down here now because they got chased by another angry flapper that managed to get into the walkway cage and the combined weight caused the structure to collapse. <laughs> Alan and Mr. Kirby swim under the cage to make their escape, while Mrs. Kirby and Eric use the steel door exit. This moment right here suggests to us that the gate not being locked properly is a cause for concern, but the end of the Lost World showed us that the angry flappers are already free range. So really, all this open door does is add a few extra flappers into the air. As they sail down the river, they pass a cluster of dinosaurs, and if I'm not mistaken, this is the first Ankylosaur in the franchise. So that earns them some points for featuring my favourite dinosaur. And I'm immediately deducting those points for bringing this CGI long necosaur way too close to the screen. <coughs> Looks like some PlayStation 2 shit when it's this close. This next part of the film is quite enjoyable. They again hear Mr. Kirby's phone ringing, but this time it's not inside the Spino, as the Spino pooped it out. They get stuck in to dig it out the crap, but when they answer, it's just a telemarketing call. You took in our time share in beautiful Guadalajara. A Serratosaurus approaches, but doesn't see them as food because of the overwhelming poo poo smell, so nothing happens. <laughs> 
Yeah, that was a fun moment. But the real fun begins when the spy knows he's in the river and starts knocking the boat about, causing Alan to drop the phone while he was trying to ring Ellie for help. On the receiving end of the call is her kid, and he goes to take the phone to Mummy, but gets distracted by a beloved cartoon. Meanwhile, the Spino is ravaging the boat. And oh, look at that. The Spino looks incredible in this scene. <laughs> If there is any CGI in this scene, it's very well blended, leaving you completely immersed in the scene. Compare how the Spino looks here to the earlier scenes. The difference is quite literally night and day. As the Spino knocks them into the river, Ellie calls back just in time to hear their distress. Hello? <laughs> Mr. Kirby climbs onto a nearby crane to create a distraction. This heroic act earns him some character points, not enough to make me like him, but at least it's something. Alan fires a flare into the Spino, causing the boat fuel in the water to ignite, sending the Spino into a panic before fleeing the scene, knocking over the crane in the process. The family has a temporary moment of grief before Mr. Kirby reveals that it was just a prank. I'm not going anywhere. They head towards the coast and hurry when they can hear the ocean, but the raptors won't allow them to leave without giving them the eggs. Eggs that have somehow not smashed after all they've been through. This one raptor zones in on Mrs. Kirby, suspecting that she has the eggs. Being a predator, you'd think these animals would just kill these guys and then take the eggs. This isn't a hostage negotiation. <laughs> just let the eggs go and we promise we won't kill you. While handing over the eggs, Alan decides to use the vocal chamber thing that Billy made. A pretty insane risk, considering that you have no idea what you're saying to these raptors. And immediately after, we hear helicopters above, which spooks the raptors into running away. The gang run to the coast and see a guy on a megaphone. Dr. Grant? Dr. Alan Grant? That's a very bad idea! Ha 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 ha. Such a fun, cutesy, family, wholesome moment. I'm being extremely mean spirited, aren't I? It turns out Eddie made some calls and managed to convince both the Navy and Army to send in a crap ton of expensive resources to rescue a few people. Ellie Sattler, the paleobotanist, apparently has some very high ranking friends in the military. You have to thank her now. She sent the Navy and the Marines. God bless you, Ellie. In the helicopter, they find Billy is still alive and then everyone flies home much in the same way the first film ended, but without the heart and soul behind it. Dr. Grant is smiling when really he should still be pissed. I know I would be. The Kirby's hint towards getting back together, which is nice, especially for Eric. And if this whole story wasn't a slap in the face to Alan Grant, I would rate it slightly higher. Like I say, this movie wasn't a total disaster. There are some fun moments to be found, if you're willing to dig through these smelly poo covered moments. 4.5 out of 10. Welcome to Jurassic World. Like I said in the intro, Jurassic World offered a small ember of hope in this dying fire of a franchise. When this movie was first announced, I was on board the hype train. It's been 14 years since the last one. That's more than enough time to get it right, right? Okay, let's see. We've got a functioning theme park bringing John Hammond's dream to reality. Oh, but they've made up a new dinosaur. Instead of utilizing the vast catalog of unused real dinosaurs. Oh, but we do see a Mosasaur and that one actually did exist. We haven't seen one of those before. Okay, so I'm still on the hype train. Even the made up dinosaur part is intriguing. Release day arrives and people lose their minds and also all of their money from their wallets, as this movie rakes in one of the highest earning openings on record. But now that we've all had some time to calm the F down, let's take a look back and see if this movie's quality is what drew all of those punters into the cinema, or was it just the irresistible allure of a new film in the Jurassic franchise?
Not a strong start. An unconvincing CGI claw with the title lazily slapped on top doesn't quite do it for me. I already talked about the perfect establishing tone of the first movie's title card, but let's do a quick comparison with the others. The Lost World, achieving pretty much the same as the first movie, but not quite as good. JP3 is about on the same level as this movie, but then take a look at Fallen Kingdom's title card. Despite the movie's many flaws, this is a decent title card. At least this title card is creative and foreshadows the volcano event. Jurassic World Dominion is the worst movie ever made, so we won't compare that. But still, this title card leaves much to be desired, and it's about to get worse. Oh god, that looks awful. <laughs> I understand the meaning of transitioning from reincarnated dinosaurs to modern day descendants of dinosaurs, but this visual presentation was awful. We won't be deterred by that opening, let's just crack on shall we? This family are packing up their car to drop off the kids at the airport, and I love how eager the older brother is to leave his possessive girlfriend for the week. Call me every day and text me pics so I don't forget what you look like. I'm only gonna be gone a week. I... I love you. See you later. Vaminos! Bye. Okay? Bye. You just know she's going to be sniffing his pillow while he's gone. The parents are sending their boys off to Jurassic World on their own because they're going to be meeting Aunt Claire, who is the park's operations manager. Welcome to Jurassic World. Yeah, I'd let her manage my operations any day because she's a highly qualified professional. The sequence of them heading to the park was quite enjoyable because it somewhat captures the childlike wonder. Dude, she said we had to wait. I don't want to wait anymore. It's how you imagined you would feel going to Disneyland as a kid, but could only afford to do so when you're 30. So you end up being less like Grey and just feel tired and want to lay down like Zack. Speaking of Zack, it was funny when he was eyeing up some girls on the boat. He's been away from his girl for less than a day, and he's already sniffing around. You guys been here before? Yeah. What do you think's gonna happen from you just staring at them? <laughs> Are we supposed to like this kid? But yeah, this wasn't the worst build up to reveal. It's got nothing on the original, of course, because in that one we actually see dinosaurs. So, we get to the main conflict of this story. Claire needs her investors to keep investing, but interest in the park's existing dinosaurs is dwindling. The solution? Make a brand new dinosaur that's even bigger and meaner, accomplished by combining the DNA of two different species. She will be 50 feet long when fully grown. Bigger than the T-Rex. It's a bad idea! In hindsight, it would be easy to call this idea dumb, but if Jurassic World was a real place, I could totally imagine corporate greed overtaking ethics and common sense. Zack, as the older brother, recognises how detached Claire has become from the family as she prioritises her career at Jurassic World, delegating her responsibility of looking after these two to her assistant. So for Claire's story, we're repeating this Dr. Grant doesn't want to be near kids element. Let's see if this pays off in a meaningful way like it did for Dr. Grant. There's an interesting side character in this who works in the control room and whose name isn't important, but what is important is what he says here. That first park was legit. You know, I have a lot of respect for it. They didn't need these genetic hybrids. They just needed dinosaurs, real dinosaurs. That's okay. kind of enough. It's like the movie knew what critics were going to say about it, and this is their way of being self-aware. But you could have instead, well, I don't know, maybe try and be as good as the first movie? It feels like a cynical movie-making tactic to be like, yeah, we know people won't like this one as much as the first, but we're still going to make a crap ton of money, so why even try? At this point I need to remind you that I still enjoy this movie, but moments like this just make me sad inside. Claire accompanies the CEO to check in on this new dinosaur, the Indominus Rex, a name that translates to Untamable King. Hang on, this is gonna be bad. 
The CEO wants Claire to get a second opinion on the security of the Indominus enclosure, insisting that the second opinion comes from her ex-boyfriend, Owen Grady. Okay. Eyes on me. Out of all of Chris Pratt's characters, Owen Grady is one I feel doesn't get the love he deserves. Imagine Jurassic World without Chris Pratt. Even the people who hate this movie or even hate Chris Pratt would agree that he's the saving grace of this movie. He fits the look and characteristics of an ex-military guy who now specialises in animal behaviour. Apparently that's called an ethologist. Charlie, hey, don't give me that shit. As the movie goes on, I'll give more depth into my rationale as to why I feel his character is more fleshed out than people give credit for. And I will say that my opinion on him has changed for the better after multiple viewings. Owen is seen as pack leader to these raptors called Blue, Charlie, Delta and Echo. The franchise ends up only caring about Blue, so that's the only raptor I care about. I really enjoyed this scene where a keeper gets yanked into the cage and Owen rushes in to stop them attacking. Oh no, hold your fire! Hold your fire, do not fire! Good. Charlie. Stay right there. It shows that even though he's their pack leader, they're still dangerous animals that he can't just keep as obedient pets. Vincent D'Onofrio, who immediately makes you think of Private Pyle from Full Metal Jacket. And your parents have any children that live? Sir, yes, sir. I bet they regret that. You're so ugly you could be a modern art masterpiece. Likes what he sees here, and he suggests that these raptors could be very useful in the military. Well, maybe if this film was taking place during the American Civil War, they could be of some use. Muskets were pretty slow on the reload, so raptors could be useful for their speed, but for present day military conflict, we have automatic guns. These expensive ass raptors would be taken out immediately in a battle. Assuming they don't eat their commanding officer before the battle even begins. Kinda silly that Vincent just watched this happen, and has come away feeling positive about his idea being a good one. An insignificant scene, but one that I love, is this petting zoo with the baby herbivores, because this part always makes me laugh. I just imagine the Diplo, or whatever this is, trampling the kid for almost choking it to death. Zack is bored of looking at the baby dinosaurs, and while the assistant is distracted, he sneaks them away to go look at some big boy dinosaurs, like the T-Rex, with the highlight being the visit to the Mosasaur tank. This is easily my favourite dinosaur of the new trilogy, because it's a type of dinosaur we've not seen before, and it's pretty damn scary. There's a scene later on that terrifies me because it combines two fears of mine, so we've got that to look forward to. Speaking of scary, this next part is sure to give you the heebie-jeebies. While inspecting the paddock, they can't see the Indominus in there, and Owen notices some scratches on the wall. Claire rushes out to alert security that the Indominus is loose, but they say no she isn't, and also why the F have you got people wandering around in there? Hey, what's the problem? It's in the cage, it's in there with you! Go! So yeah, the Indominus eats a guard and then breaks the security door while chasing Owen. Owen covers himself in motor oil to disguise his manly musk, after seeing the tubby workman get eaten. Oh. Claire's in the control room trying to keep people calm, but Owen's all like, yeah, nah, you've got to evacuate the island. This thing was smart enough to trick its way out of escaping. Who knows what she's capable of? We quickly learn that she's also capable of camouflage, because part of her DNA contains cuttlefish genes. Very well, I will eat the cuttlefish! She also managed to rip out her tracking implant, which sounds dumb, but I don't know enough about implants to dispute it. So, after a bunch of armed personnel get eaten, Claire decides, hmm, okay then, we'll start closing down the park. But not all of the park, we don't want to start losing money. She then has a panicky moment realising her nephews are still in the park, and for some reason her assistant hasn't yet raised the alarm that the two kids are missing. Bear in mind that by this point they've been to two different attractions, and probably a good half an hour or more queuing up for the gyrospheres. Claire tries calling the boys, but the signal is too weak. Zack then spots a gate that's been busted open with claw marks on the metalwork. Now I don't know if he's stupid or just doesn't care about protecting his little bro, but he takes them inside. I'm just worried that you're not getting the full Jurassic World experience. You're a dick. They come across a small herd of ankylosaurs, and then Grey spots another dinosaur behind them. <laughs> 
the Indominus goes mental, killing the best herbivore ever just because it loves killing. Seriously, look at how many Apotosaurus it kills for nothing more than sport. One part that's always bugged me, and it's a small detail, but look at the position of their seats as the Indominus holds them in the air, and in the next cut their seats are facing the other way, which now allows them to fall out and escape. Owen and Claire find the gyrosphere all torn up, but the boys left a trail leading to the edge of a cliff, and they come to the conclusion that the boys must have jumped. Owen says Claire should get back to safety because she's wearing heels, which will only slow down the search party. He is of course absolutely right, but then she rolls up her sleeves and unbuttons her blouse, and I'm losing my trail of thought. Oh come on, look, if my wife is allowed to fancy Henry Cavill, then I'm allowed to fancy Bryce Dallas Howard, and Margot Robbie, and Natalie Dormer, and Sydney Sweeney and Henry Cavill. The boys hide out in the old visitor centre from Jurassic Park, and this part just comes across like member berries, because why the hell would this building still be standing? They would have absolutely demolished this for a new park. Because of this, I'm not going to waste my time on this scene, let's just get back to the… good stuff? So Vincent D'Onofrio suggests that they should use the raptors to track down and kill the Indominus, which considering how terrible of a job the humans are doing, it's at least worth considering. But Vincent saw firsthand how these raptors are temperamental with their obedience. They are clearly not ready to follow a human into battle. The CEO steps in and says, look, I can handle it. I can fly a helicopter, just about. <laughs> They shoot at the Indominus but miss their shots horribly, causing her to go on a rampage and break open the aviary. Loads of Dimorphodons and other pterosaurs smash into the heli, and so that's good night Mr CEO. I was kind of shocked they killed him off in this way, not that I particularly cared about him, but they seemed to be building him up as a pivotal character for this story. The flappy birds swarm the park, and there's a few things about this sequence that I find enjoyable. One is the air raid sirens. raid sirens freak me out, so this was a perfect way to manipulate my fear level. The second thing I always enjoy seeing is Jimmy Buffett's cameo as he rushes away carrying his margaritas. I just learned he died this year, man that's sad, but kudos to you Jimmy Buffett for being enough of a mad lad to make a cameo in such a funny way. The last part to mention is the death scene of the assistant, that for some reason had many people online upset, saying that her death was unnecessarily cruel and tasteless, and I suppose yeah, her death scene was a bit drawn out. But let's remember that animals aren't typically known for their humane killing. We're just watching one bird try and eat a human, and then watching the Mosasaur finish the job. This was no more horrible than what happened to poor old Eddie in the Lost World. Or the slow, agonising death of Sparky by way of a Jillian Compies. The assistant's death scene was entertaining, and that's the point of a Jurassic Park disaster. Is it considered tasteless because no one stopped to cry about it? The only two people who saw it happen were these two boys, and they don't even really know her to care. Oh yeah, and let's not forget there's a ton of flying birds flapping about, threatening to do something equally as horrible to the boys, so that's probably playing on their minds. Like I hinted at earlier, this was the scene that combined my two fears, being stranded in a large body of water where you can't see what's below, and giant sea monsters. With the CEO out of the picture, there's no one to stop Vincent carrying out his raptor plan. You'd think that common sense would stop him, but here we are. Now it's worth pointing out that Vincent's made it obvious that he only cares about seeing the potential of these raptors, so really he's got nothing to lose with this plan, apart from maybe all of his men and also his own life. 
After Chris and Claire reunite with the boys, Owen gives Vincent a chin tickle to say, who's a silly boy? You are. These are my raptors, you shouldn't be anywhere near them. But then Vincent says, well, this is our only chance to take out the Indominus. And he's kind of right. At this point, what other option is there? And so off they go in a scene that piqued everyone's interest in the movie's trailer. Chris Pratt on a motorcycle riding alongside Raptors. Congratulations, you just made $1.6 billion. They soon track down the Indominus, but instead of attacking, the Raptors start chatting with it, making Owen realize what secret dinosaur DNA was used in its creation. That thing's part Raptor. Ah, uh, she. But hold on a sec, why on earth would they use a notoriously smart dinosaur for part of its genetic makeup? Their goal was to make a bigger, scarier dinosaur, not a smarter one. According to the Jurassic Park fan wiki, these are all of the genomes mixed into the Indominus DNA. Just take out the raptor part and make it as dumb as a regular old dinosaur. Ah. I think it would have made the Indominus more intimidating if we had been presented with all of this information on the fan wiki in the film. Perhaps the gang could have stumbled upon a secret file and started reading out some of this information for the audience, just so we could appreciate how much of a Frankenstein's monster we're dealing with here. It was given T-Rex genes to give it a stronger bite that can crush the bones of its prey. Therizinosaurus genes gave it long slashing claws. Dana such as genes made its teeth resemble that of a crocodilian. Giganotosaurus, among the largest predators to ever walk the earth, gives the Indominus a size that will make you cower in fear. Ha ha ha, Hausenberg used AI because he has trouble pronouncing certain dinosaur names. But then again, listen to the way I just said Indominus. Jokes on me too, I suppose. I just made the Indominus scarier by revealing information that the movie chose to withhold. Supposing this is all true, of course. But yeah, you're welcome, movie. They open fire with several men unloading their guns on this animal, and they even launch a rocket that explodes next to it. This is a trope that I absolutely cannot stand in movies. Even if one bullet managed to penetrate the animal's flesh and internal organs, it would kind of be a problem. And in the majority of these big budget creature features, the animal never gets hurt by bullets. This isn't some titanium skinned alien, it's a flesh and bones animal. If half of these gunshots hit, the Indominus would be turned into Swiss cheese. Well, anyway, the Indominus walks away, even with the RPG explosion. And now the gang have a new problem on their hands, as the Raptors have a new alpha, and so they start picking off the side characters. The team does manage to explode one of the Raptors, which comes across more comical than sad. Claire frantically drives away with the boys in one of the better action sequences of this movie. The raptors are chasing down the car and you really get the sense of how fast these animals are, or perhaps how slow this car is. I like this moment where the raptor comes dangerously close to getting on the car, but the boys zap it back down with a cattle prod. I didn't mind the raptor jump scare either. <laughs> By this point, the park has been mostly evacuated, as Owen and the gang take shelter in the visitor's centre. For some reason, they decide to waste time looking at some animals in tanks, instead of, well, I don't know, maybe make some calls? Calling the military or something. Vincent and InGen start taking away the DNA samples because money. And then out of nowhere, one of the raptors, apparently this one is Delta, corners Vincent and brings an end to this silly man. I'm on your side. Outside, the other raptors circle around, awaiting Blue as the beta to make the first move on Owen. Owen then wins Blue back on his side by calmly approaching and removing its headwear. And just in time too, as the Indominus is back on the scene. The raptors are doing their best, but they could do with a hand. So Claire makes a call to the only loyal man left in the control centre, commanding him to release the T-Rex.
sexy appearing from the shadows is still a moment I love, as I'm a simple man. Everyone's already clowned on this moment where Claire's running away in heels, but it's absolutely worth clowning on again. She must have the ankle strength of an elephant. How the hell is she able to match the pace of a T-Rex while wearing high heels? If she took off her shoes, it would have made the scene much better. And no, this isn't some foot fetish thing. Calm down, Quentin. If she took off her shoes, it would have symbolised that she is ready to ditch the corporate look in order to get the job done, further emphasising the very point that she tried making earlier on, but was essentially scoffed at. What is that supposed to mean? It means I'm ready to go. Back to the fight, I quite enjoyed this moment where the Rex busts through the dinosaur bones and roars. Need I repeat myself? I'm a simple man. The Titans clash in a very satisfying way, with Blue helping out the Rex for reasons that I'm not sure I understand. In this kind of situation, isn't it instinctual for the smaller animal to run away from the conflict? Well, whatever, the Indominus is running out of steam, but still putting up a decent fight, and then this happens. Come on, you have to admit, even if you hate this film, that was a great moment. There's a brief moment of families reuniting to wrap up the movie with some emotion, but I just don't feel it. Because honestly, I didn't care much for these kids. If they didn't make Zack such a dick to his younger brother, or give him a redeeming moment to show how much he actually does love him, I would have been able to emotionally connect with this ending. Also, Claire is seen giving Grey a cuddle, and this is supposed to show that she does love her nephews, and that she's moved away from her businesswoman mindset. But the movie quickly moves on to focus the scene on Claire and Owen being together, which is fine, but for me it takes the punch out of this emotional reunion with the family. <laughs> Earlier on, I said that Owen Grady has a little more character development than people give credit for, but I think I misspoke. What I meant to say, and I did suggest, is that Owen Grady is arguably the glue holding this breaking franchise together. This will become more apparent in the last two movies. As characters go, I liked Claire. Bryce Dallas Howard did a good job with what she was given to work with. She's a believable, classy CEO type. But when it comes to the other frontline characters, they were mid at best. Nothing against the actors, just the characters they were playing. Chris Pratt, on the other hand, was everything we needed him to be. And I'm 100% certain that the movie would have been worse without him. Jurassic World ends with Rexy roaring triumphantly at the abandoned park. Settle down, Rexy. The movie wasn't a complete triumph, but I will say it's the best Jurassic movie since the first. And I know that's not saying much, but we should count ourselves lucky that the movie was a reasonable 6 out of 10, because things are about to get very stinky. <laughs> Remember that small ember of hope I had from the previous film? Yeah, this film is all kinds of stupid, and it pains me to see the franchise dip so low. Don't worry Michael Crichton, I've got this. In concept, the story of this film is fine, being that the last remaining island of dinosaurs is due to face extinction because of this volcano. Some people want the dinosaurs to live to preserve life, and some people want the dinosaurs to live for profit. And so there's your conflict. If it was just kept this simple, I think they could have had something here. But the problem is the blueprint for this movie was drawn using Mr. Hanky the Christmas Poo as a pen. I told Steven Spielberg, I think the heart of the story is about poo. The opening tone of this movie showed some promise. Some InGen people have come to extract a bone sample from the skeleton of the Indominus, and as they float this sample to the surface, we see this ominous shadow of the Mosasaur, which they presume to be dead as it's been three years since the park was abandoned. The price for not checking the area first is they get gobbled up. The rest of the team on the surface are being just as silly, with this guy unable to hear the helicopter crew warning him that a T-Rex is in the bushes. What is going on? I can't hear you! 
<laughs> what do you mean you can't hear them? You are wearing a headset for this very reason. And strangely enough, you could hear them perfectly well a moment ago. Air one, clear for takeoff. Begin tracking. Copy that. Go, go. Tracking on. I'm coming back for you. Close the doors. Marine one, I gotta close the gate. Get out of there. The guy clings on to the ladder as Rexy yanks at it. And just as they get free, the Mosasaur gets hungry again. The rest of the team get away with the sample secured, and the Mosasaur now free to roam the open oceans. Many have pointed out the inconsistency with the Mosasaur enclosure, as the previous movie showed it to be located in the centre of the park. But now in this movie, it's next to the ocean. <laughs> ah, whatever, we've got the rest of this movie to get through. As I did for the other films, I will give credit where credit is due. So with that said, I did like this segment, showing us how the world is reporting and responding to the impending doom of the dinosaurs. Geologists now predict an extinction level event will kill off the last living dinosaurs on the planet. Having a real life news anchor from the BBC delivering the news gives the movie a sense of realism, which it desperately needs. Not exactly a groundbreaking method of exposition, as several movies have done this before, including The Lost World, but this is just me scraping for compliments to give this movie. Ian Malcolm's giving a speech to convince the world not to rescue the dinosaurs, letting nature run its course. Someone in the crowd utters the word murderer to him. Like he's in any way to blame for this situation, he's been saying from the start that life should not be tampered with. This is a man-made situation. If it wasn't for the actions of mankind in the first place, these dinosaurs wouldn't exist to suffer right now. Most of what Ian says here should be common sense, and yet he has to spell it out for these drips to understand what's at stake. In the last century, we amassed a landmark technological power, and we've consistently proven ourselves incapable of handling that power. Claire is now running a charity that protects dinosaurs, which is almost an unbelievable 180 from her previous job. But obviously we don't have a park to manage anymore, so giving her this new job in a sequel makes sense. She works with two key employees who will appear later in the movie. The first is Zia Rodriguez, whose personality is exactly what you'd think it would be looking at her. And secondly, Franklin Webb, played by Justice Smith, whose personality is, well, take a look at this clip. Yeah, that kind of tells you what you need to know. All hope is lost as the news comes in that the dinosaurs will be left to die. But then Claire gets a call from Benjamin Lockwood, inviting her over to his massive mansion for dinner. What do you mean you don't know who Benjamin Lockwood is? He's John Hammond's ex-business partner, who was never mentioned in any previous source material. Lockwood says that he will fully support an evacuation mission organised by a good guy called Eli, who's definitely going to remain a good guy. Eli says that rescuing Blue is priority number one because of how intelligent she is. But this is a life preserving mission, right? All these dinosaurs should have the same level of priority, right? And for some reason, him saying this doesn't ring any alarm bells. She is alarmed, however, by the news that in order for this mission to go smoothly, they need Owen Grady on the team. For some reason, they're no longer a couple, so she has to go and convince him to come back. From their conversation, we understand that their lifestyles are incompatible. But to me, this off-camera breakup feels more false than JP3's. Claire's upset that Owen isn't upset at the idea of the dinosaurs being wiped out. And so she says, well, okay then, your name is still on the flight manifest. So come, don't come, whatever, I couldn't care less. Before inevitably deciding that he will go, he watches some footage from when the raptors were little babies. And I can't deny, I liked this moment. Just look at them, they're friggin' adorable. He gets on the plane and meets Claire's annoying assistants. True to their characters, girl boss is being a girl boss, and whiny bitch boy is scared of flying. Nervous flyer? Would you ride a thousand pound horse that's been abused all its life? I rode my motorcycle through the jungle with a pack of raptors. We're not compatible. Before we go on, I will say that my hatred for Franklin is only tied to Franklin and not the actor Justice Smith. I liked him in Detective Pikachu, and that's the one compliment I'm going to pass your way. Because from here on, you are simply the character Franklin, and that character is insufferable in every scene he's in. Wow, it's too hot. Wow, I don't like bugs. 
They roll up at the dilapidated Jurassic World Visitor Center, and they get out to gorp at a passing Brachiosaur. A fairly nice moment that I sure hope no one sours. Can we? <laughs> Why do you even work for a charity that saves dinosaurs if you have no interest in seeing them? At least Girl Boss showed some emotion. I won't keep calling her Girl Boss as the joke's old now. Her actual name is Zia. They hurry on to some sort of emergency control room and using a radio tower while they manage to locate Blue. When they get in close proximity of Blue, Owen advises that he needs to go alone if they're to stand a chance of getting her calmly. He tries feeding her a lump of meat and we get this fun moment. Here you go. That's right. Okay. I do praise the movie for showing that she's become slightly untrusting of him. An understandable development if you feel that you've been abandoned by your alpha. One of the antagonists in this film is the guy who played Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. In Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, he plays a guy called Ken Wheatley. Ken grows impatient and tranks Blue before Owen gives the signal. Blue freaks out and jumps one of the crew, causing him to shoot Blue as she rips his face open. Then Owen goes to attack Ken, but he also gets tranked. Owen! What are you doing? Oh. Some words get exchanged between Zia and Ken, and they're about to start a gunfight, but then Zia says if they shoot her, there's no one to attend to Blue's bullet wounds. As Owen lays on the floor paralyzed, they move out, because the volcano is starting to erupt. Claire and Franklin have also been left behind, as Ken's crew close the doors on them. <laughs> Why would they do this? You're killing two people for absolutely no reason here. The next part is played for laughs and a gross out. <laughs> Succeeding in both of these goals, but it does seem a bit out of place considering the impending doom. To keep the laughs going, Owen has somehow recovered from the trank dart, just enough to move his body along the floor like a floppy fish. No. Leonardo DiCaprio did it way better. I got it. I've got it. I can roll. I can roll. Mm. <sighs> Franklin opens a door connecting the tunnel to the outside, and then something fierce sounding starts making its way towards them. When I saw it say Baryonyx, I got so excited, because it's such a cool looking dinosaur, and I don't believe we've seen it so far in the franchise. But this potentially awesome moment is immediately ruined by the most obnoxious scream ever put to cinema. <laughs> Look, I get that his character is supposed to be pathetic, but why on earth would they have him scream like a four-year-old girl watching Peppa Pig's visit to the abattoir? <laughs> Every time I hear this scream, I just get lost in thoughts, trying to sum up exactly why I hate it so much. It's just a scream that's way over the top, and clearly Justice Smith was told to give a bit extra here, because it just feels so forced and overacted. <laughs> I'm open to the idea that I'm wrong on this, but I can't deny how I feel. We meet this movie's kid character called Maisie Lockwood, and honestly, for a kid, she's a fairly decent actor in this. I've not seen any other video talking about her positively, but in my opinion, there's nothing wrong with her character or her acting. I'm only going to say that for this film though, because in the final film, she's absolutely unbearable. As you might have guessed, this is Benjamin Lockwood's granddaughter. She's asking Grandpa some questions about her dead mum, and he says something along the lines of, Well, Maisie, you could be her mirror image. You look almost too similar to my daughter. This conversation will be important information for later. Claire and Franklin just about managed to escape from the Baryonyx, but it's out of the fire and into the frying pan, as the volcano is going apeshit and so too are the dinosaurs. Everyone sprints for their lives as the dinosaurs stampede downhill, and our gang takes shelter temporarily behind a large piece of tree. Now, I don't know this for certain, but I think I spot an editing mistake here. Or perhaps it was just poorly directed, because look at when the actors scream here.
They scream after a dinosaur has already passed, but they're screaming like they just saw a giant carnivore approaching. Watch it again. Do you see what I mean? The gang have no option but to climb into the gyrosphere, and they freeze when a Carnotaura size them up. But luckily for them, a juicy Cynoceratops comes along, and we get a fight scene that I actually quite enjoyed. <laughs> to the best of my recollection, we've not seen a larger predator utilising its powerful legs in combat, a strategy that makes sense when you've got piddly little arms. You look pathetic, son. Get yourself down the gym. As they scrap, a T-Rex comes in to take out the Carno. It's a very cinematic moment, accentuated by the volcanic eruption. The pyroclastic flow makes this scene a race to safety, but miraculously our gang managed to outrun it slash outroll it off the cliff and into the sea. I will suspend my disbelief for all of this, because it was a very enjoyable sequence. Honestly, if this film had focused more on the disaster elements and did away with all the goofy stuff, I'd be a happy boy. Owen manages to prise open the door and they swim to the surface. When they get to the beach, Claire and Franklin talk about this mission being a lie. But when you think about it, no, it wasn't a lie. She was told from the start that they would be evacuating dinosaurs from the island. And that's exactly what they're doing right now. Yes, they abandoned you guys, and that's not very nice. But the mission is still a success as far as the bad guys are concerned. There's a grim moment where it's established that Ken likes to collect dinosaur teeth. <laughs> You're gonna feel that when you wake up. It's not an important thing, it's just a thing. The baddies haul ass to get off the docks, and so do our heroes, luckily finding one last truck so they can jump off the pier and into the boat. Action movie style. Everyone watches as a lone brachiosaur gets consumed by the pyroclastic flow. It's pretty sad and visually quite stunning. Some people have dunked on this moment, including Mauler, and I'm not saying he's wrong, I just didn't feel as critical about this moment. His video on this movie is pretty great, and I do recommend you go watch it, after watching the entirety of my video of course. Back in the Lockwood estate, Eli is revealing his evilness by showing another obvious bad guy their plans to create a new dinosaur that is genetically designed to be used in military combat. Yeah, they're still rolling with the military idea. <laughs> Using the DNA of the Indominus, they've created a new dinosaur called the Indoraptor. I think it would have been much cooler if they acknowledged the unpredictability problem when making the Indominus, and instead chose to resurrect a Megaraptor. Given the rationale that a Megaraptor would be as smart as a Velociraptor, while also having the brute strength of a larger predator, this is the kind of dinosaur that would have pleased audiences too, as it's a real genus of dinosaur with a familiar name that would excite both casual dinosaur enjoyers and dinosaur enthusiasts. Doing this would have also given the movie a fresh feeling, as we did the made-up dinosaur thing last movie. I like it. I know, it's great, right? Another! <laughs> Maisie overheard the evil man conversation and tries to tell Grandpa, but he's all like, bro, shut up, I'm trying to sleep. I'll look into it in the morning. I'll find out tomorrow. Go to bed. Good night. Shut the f*** up, you cunt! Back on the boat, Owen and the gang tend to Blue's injuries. They somehow haven't been questioned or even spotted by anyone else aboard, but whatever. To save Blue's life, they need to extract blood from the T-Rex, and for as dumb as this scene ends up being, I did quite enjoy it. They actually managed to make contact with the T-Rex, and it feels like a special moment that many people would kill to experience. One of the reasons why this scene is stupid, however, is because for some reason, this T-Rex hasn't been fully sedated to the point where it's knocked out. They've only just begun extracting blood and it's already stirring. Shouldn't this thing be fully knocked out for the entire boat journey, which I'm assuming would be several hours at sea? 
When it fully wakes up and starts going nuts in the cage, not a single guard comes to check on it, which is especially stupid considering that a guard closed the cage door a moment ago. That door's open. I got it. The scene is slightly saved with a cool, fun times action movie moment of Owen diving through the Rex's jaws. As Dr. Wu argues about the creation of the Indoraptor, Maisie spies on them and then she starts slowly backing up into arm's reach of the Indoraptor. Grandpa demands an explanation from Eli, and so he's all like, time to die, old man. And we get the symbolic smashing of John Hammond's cane. A really forced moment, but we all get the point. En route to the mansion, Owen and Claire are spotted by Ken's crew, and so they get slung in prison. Hi, Claire. I just wanted to come. <laughs> They have zero reason to keep Owen and Claire alive, and they could have easily covered up their death by saying that they died on the island. Eli even says the following. As far as everybody else is concerned, they burned up on the island. So just do it then? Well, anyway, they happen to be next door to a Stiggy Moloch. <laughs> sounds like Sticky Bollock. And Owen realises the Stiggy Moloch will charge forward every time he whistles. And so he uses this to his advantage by getting the Stiggy Moloch to bash the cage open. <laughs> It's another goofy moment, but I'll let it slide, because, well, they did have to escape somehow. So now we come to the main point of this movie. The smuggled dinosaurs are being auctioned off to wealthy billionaires, and I know what you're thinking, because I'm thinking it too. How on earth does a mansion exist that's large enough to imprison and freely transport huge containers of dinosaurs? This mansion was presumably purchased and designed by Grandpa Lockwood, and he would have never signed off on the mansion being designed for this purpose, and it was so obviously built for this purpose. So considering how he protested this, we can assume that he was somehow unaware of this auction being prepared for. Did you really think you could get away with it? In my own house. You entrusted me to guide your fortune into the future. I have done that. Damn you! And now comes the time for the world to meet the Indoraptor. Visually speaking, this dinosaur is pretty cool, and the way it's introduced works perfectly well. Michael Giacchino also delivered hard on this score. As many of you know, I am a Michael Giacchino simp, but I feel that my love is warranted. This man's music heightens any film he's hired on. Owen lures the Stiggy Moloch into the elevator, and the movie gets goofy again as it plows through the auction crowd. <laughs> Owen then single-handedly takes on the guards, who you would assume are hired for their combat and crowd control skills, and yet they can't handle one ex-navy guy. I don't know if that speaks to the skill level of navy guys, or the ineptitude of these guards. The auction house gets cleared out, leaving the Indoraptor in the company of Ken, who shoots it with a couple of sedatives. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the moment where I almost gave up on this movie. The Indoraptor somehow has the intelligence and fortitude to pretend that these sedatives aren't really working, and it tricks Ken into approaching to extract a tooth. It even appears to give off a cheeky smile for the audience. Oh god, this, this scene man. <laughs> This scene just feels like it's been ripped straight out of a Marvel movie. It's equally as goofy as the Spino Mobile moment, but it's somehow stupider. Let that sink in. Eli catches Owen and Claire trying to rescue Maisie, and it's here that it's revealed that Maisie wasn't conceived naturally, she's a clone of her mother. Seems like an unnecessary part to the story, which doesn't really add much and only raises questions. Questions that we simply don't have the time for. We're supposed to be nearing the movie's climax, as we now have an Indoraptor on the loose. Oh yeah, speaking of which... 
They get separated as the Indoraptor chases them around the mansion. In a sequence that wasn't too bad, I enjoyed it for what it was, and it did feel like an animal hunting down its prey. I know that seems like it would be a given, but bear with me because this next part decides that no, the Indoraptor isn't an animal relentlessly driven to kill. Now, the Indoraptor is going to act like a monster from a horror movie. As it slowly creeps through Maisie's bedroom doors, gently opening the doors rather than smashing them down, like we just saw it do to everything else. And as Maisie cowers under the bedsheets, its claw slowly creeps towards her like it's a friggin' boogeyman. <laughs> The director even says that this scene was an homage to a Dracula film. I thought it was the same idea and I wanted to bring back that fear that I had. Did you not realise the tonal shift you shoehorned into this movie? Did you not realise that doing this massively contradicts the behaviour of this animal that we saw in the scenes leading up to this? Fine, you did a good job in emulating the same feeling of that Dracula scene. It's a common practice among filmmakers to borrow from other films, but you're supposed to borrow something when that thing fits naturally with what you're making. This ain't the time for an homage to Dracula. Well anyway, Owen comes in and shoots at it, and then Blue comes in to join the fight. <laughs> Yeah, let's just sit on the bed rather than make a run for it. They end up in a standoff with the Indoraptor, standing on the glass roof above the museum. Earlier on, it was established that the Indoraptor attacks anything that this special laser points at. So Claire aims the laser at Owen, somehow predicting that the Indoraptor would fall through the glass instead of successfully hitting its target and murdering Owen. <laughs> Owen was somehow also privy to this plan, as he knew to slide out of the way. Blue helps out once again to push it down onto the Triceratops spikes below. And that's the end of the Indoraptor. Earlier on, in a scene that I can't be bothered to explain in detail, an off-target bullet released toxic gas into the prison cells. <laughs> The gang reach the control panels in time to open the cell doors, but Owen warns her not to open the main door, as releasing these dinosaurs into the wild is a terrible idea. But then Maisie gets upset because she's a clone, just like them, and so she opens the doors herself. So, in summary, the existence of the final movie is entirely Maisie's fault. You press that button, there is no going back. The T-Rex and the Carno finish off the bad guy. And also the sample of the Indoraptor. Well, at least that means we're not going to be seeing any more made-up dinosaurs. The movie ends with a speech from Ian Malcolm, explaining that we never seem to learn our lesson. How many times do you have to see the evidence? How many times must the point be made? Too many red lines have been crossed. Wait, is he speaking directly to the audience here? We all saw this movie and decided to pay money to see Jurassic World Dominion. Well, we've come this far, we have to see it through, right? The very last moment of this movie actually gave me some hope, as Blue looks over this suburban town. It gave me hope that the last movie could be a scaled back survival horror, as dinosaurs wreak havoc upon the world. But before we get to the movie that slapped that hope down into the mud, we have a short film to talk about, and it's legitimately up there as the best Jurassic content available. But for Fallen Kingdom, you're getting a 3 out of 10. You stink. Family claim to be a near death experience. Is this the new this normal? The I wish this was the new normal. This short film has no right being as good as it is, considering that it's sandwiched between these two turds, and also written and directed by the same people. What the hell is going on? <laughs> This short film takes place after the dinosaurs escaped. The little girl explains that she saw a dinosaur just like this near her school, suggesting that people are learning to live among the dinosaurs. I am not sure why you would take your family camping in the woods at a time like this, but the surprised look on dad's face suggests that he thought he chose a safe camping spot. Even though this is just a Nasutoceratops, a relatively harmless herbivore, the family act like real people, watching on cautiously from the safety of their camper. They even mentioned that the park ranger gave them advice, should they come into this situation. People acting like real people in a Jurassic movie? Did we just travel back in time to 1993? 
I will say the dad acted a bit too calmly when the Allosaurus appeared, but he soon learned his lesson. <laughs> For the very first time, I believe, we actually see some family dynamic with these dinosaurs, as the daddy Nasuto charges in to protect his family, meaning the herbivores win for once. <laughs> but then the Allosaurus hears the toddler crying, and so it tries to eat them instead. Honestly, I am blown away by the fact that this toddler is crying as if this is really happening. I'm not sure I want to know how they made the kid cry like this, because damn does this scene feel authentic. <laughs> this is exactly what Jurassic World should have turned into, as I suggested it could have at the end of the last movie. I love the practical set, the lighting, the editing, the fact that the mum and dad have to work together to protect their family. It's all just so well executed. The battle ends when the young girl shoots some arrows into the aloe's mouth, causing it to run away in fear. <laughs> Allosaurus? More like Goodbye-saurus. Well, anyway, this moment was a cool payoff to the dad saying that he wasn't happy with the other camper letting his kid play with a crossbow. Overall, just a solid short film, the highlights being the intensity of the Allosaurus attack. The character interactions felt natural, except for that one part where they felt it necessary to explicitly tell the audience that these are two separate families that are now one. And then the dad character immediately repeats this point. Hey. We've been a family for two years now, okay? Look, I, uh, I know this is still new, but we are a family now. This is not information we need in a film that's only 10 minutes long. And if you did feel it was necessary, it could have been done a bit more subtly. Aside from that, I have no complaints. And I would have been extremely happy for this short film to have been a taster for the final movie. Speaking of which, I don't think I can put it off any longer. Let's give this short film a 7.5 out of 10 and enter the cesspit known as Jurassic World Dominion. Jurassic World Dominion is the only movie that caused me to make an unscripted rant video the very moment I got home from the cinema. Never before had I felt so personally disrespected as a lifelong Jurassic fan and paying customer. Never before have I been so utterly bewildered by the choices made. All you had to do was throw a bunch of cool dinosaurs on screen and show us how the world deals with that problem. But the movie instead chooses to focus on the following. Black market trading of dinosaurs. Again. A velociraptor's been kidnapped. Again. And giant locusts. Again. Oh wait, no, this is new. No Jurassic movie's done this before, and for good reason. The previous movie set up the threat of a world dominated by dinosaurs, a point which I'll be unpacking a bit more later. For some reason, this movie chose to scrap that idea as being a cool premise for the final instalment, and gave us giant locusts instead. Now I don't want to derail myself here with my hatred for this movie, so let's begin recapping the quote-unquote story. I chose to watch the extended version, as people on the internet said it included more character moments, which surely enhances the story. So in the act of fairness, I chose to watch the best version available to give this movie more of a chance to shine than the theatrical version did. The movie opens with an epilogue showing what life was like when the dinosaurs first roamed the earth. Nothing too amazing, but at least it did set up the idea that there's a dinosaur that can compete with the T-Rex. <laughs> Something which the movie pays off with the end conflict, but the problem is, even though these dinosaurs lived in the same time span of the late Cretaceous period, they existed millions of years apart. Understandably, most casual viewers wouldn't know this, and I too had to look it up to make sure I was correct in questioning this. But still, this shows a lack of respect for the intelligence of the audience. We cut to a helicopter chasing Rexy through a forest, where it ends up finding a drive-in cinema, and already I'm frustrated and annoyed. Just watch.
up. People are screaming and running for their lives as a giant creature tramples its way through the audience. But this couple are apparently so enamoured by their intimate moments that they remain oblivious to this. <laughs> a slight test of believability, but fine. What isn't fine, however, is these motherfuckers. <laughs> You're in the open air. You can definitely hear these people screaming, if not the giant tremors of the Rex's footsteps. How can you all be as equally as deaf? The stupidity continues as the helicopter guy fires a trank dart and misses. <laughs> Opting for a headshot rather than choosing the enormous, unmissable body. <laughs> Keep it steady! Also, why on earth would you be driving your car in the direction of the T-Rex? Time to take away this old geezer's license. Rexy escapes and the logo appears. And this is the point where I should have left the cinema. We get a recap and some establishing information in the form of a social media video from Now This. And it shows us a graphic of how the dinosaurs spread across the globe in the four years since Fallen Kingdom. Remember the end of Fallen Kingdom? Where only a handful of dinosaurs escaped. An amount of dinosaurs that surely wouldn't have been a problem for the military to deal with. Realistically, these animals would have been wiped out long before they managed to spread out to multiple states. Bear in mind these animals would have needed to find nesting grounds before breeding. They don't just reproduce like germs. Building a dinosaur family takes time. I can at least understand the Mosasaur situation. It would have been a lot harder to track this thing down. This moment right here is another example of a scaled back conflict that the movie could have been focused on, giving us a Jaws-like movie. Damn would I have loved that. Right, let's see some characters shall we? Claire and Zia have broken into a cattle ranch to document the illegal trading of dinosaurs. Seeing the victims of this crime tugs at Claire's heartstrings, so they pick the cutest one to rescue, putting the cattle ranch on red alert. A chase ensues across a field of cyanos and other horned rhino dinos. Fortunately, the rhino dinos only attack the bad guys, meaning our heroes can escape with some Marvel level dialogue. Everybody good? No! no! By some miracle, Franklin Webb isn't a horrible character in this one. We see him reasonably and calmly explain that he's finding this type of work too dangerous, and he's got another job lined up that he's going to take so he can live safely while still making a difference in the world. We'll see what job that is soon enough. Zia Rodriguez happens to agree with him. And look at this, these two characters are interacting like human beings. Friends even. My voice is kind of shot, I've got a flu. Great. But the show must go on. We then cut to a cinematic cutscene from Red Dead Redemption, but this time I want to hit the skip button because Chris Pratt and some other cowboys are rustling some parasaurs. Let's bring them all! Yeah! And Chris manages to calm one of them down using his signature hand manoeuvre. This hand manoeuvre becomes a real issue for me later in the movie. You'll see why. Well, it turns out those darned O'Driscoll boys want this steer for themselves, claiming their rights to it as the authority. But then Chris Pratt says, no, these guys behind me are the authority. You guys are no good lying snakes in the grass. The Driscoll boys hold up guns and say, yeah, what now? And so they steal the parasaur. Owen says he needs to avoid contact to stay alive for his family, who currently reside in this log cabin. Maisie's wandering around outside and comes across a login site. What is she doing here? Well, that's not important. But luckily she is here because she gives this worker instructions that can help lead these apatosaurs away to safety. Sure, why not? Let's follow the advice of some kid who we've never met. Oh, but questions are mean and this is a nice moment. Don't be a Grinch, Hausenberg. Well, looks like her work is done here. She's already leaving. <laughs> So yeah, she really had no incentive to come here in the first place. We just needed her here for this scene to happen. Maisie and Claire have a typical teenage daughter slash mother dynamic, and that's fine I guess. She is however more connected with Owen for reasons. Watching this happy family from the bushes is Blue, who has a happy little family of her own, with her daughter named Beta. Because this film is progressive, we didn't need a man raptor on the scene, being all toxic and stuff. Blue was able to reproduce asexually. No, I'm not joking, and I'm not going to bother asking questions, especially when I don't care for the answer. 
There's a really funny slow-mo shot when some hunters shoot at Blue. <laughs> Is it just me? That, that looks really goofy to me. Maisie's mopey because she's not allowed to go too far from the cabin, as there are people out there who want to capture her because she's a clone and therefore seen as a valuable research asset. And we'll meet who these researchers are soon enough, because an O'Driscoll boy found out where she's been hiding. Oh, wait, wait, what? Where have we cut to now? Are we still watching the same movie? Why have we cut to a random ass farm? Who are these kids and what the hell is that? Oh, it's a swarm of giant locusts. Oh yeah, classic Jurassic stuff. It was honestly so hard for me to script this part. I'm not typically so negative about the media I consume, but what the, the fucking fuck, fuck am I looking at here? The only way I recognise this as being in-universe is the fact that Laura Dern shows up, reprising her role as Ellie Sattler. Ellie notices that the locusts didn't eat the crops from the other farms, and she finds out the other farmers have been using seeds from a corporation called Biosyn. She needs a second opinion to determine if this is actually a locust, and who better to consult with than a guy who specialises in dinosaur bones? It's Alan Grant! He's currently preaching how cool paleontology is, but these girls are like totally not feeling his vibes. <laughs> Stop. It says here that the T-Rex had a tiny brain. They've been around since like the 90s. I don't get why we're here digging up bones. It just seems kind of random. Yeah, that seems like natural dialogue for teenagers. It says here that the T-Rex had a tiny brain. Alan and Ellie's reunion is okay. It's nice seeing them back together again. And it's here we learn that Ellie has split from her partner now, so she can hook up with her old flame again at the end of the movie. This nice moment of reunion is immediately tainted by this donkey brain line. Oh, it's a locust. Mandibles, wings, thorax, but God, the size of it is massive. You don't say. Ellie informs him that Ian has invited her to his lecture at Biosyn, as he needs to spill some secrets to her about the corporation. Ellie wants Alan to tag along as a key witness, and blah blah blah. Not interesting, cut into the next scene. This is Biosyn's wildlife depot, where the dinosaurs get health checks before being transported to their sanctuary. Ellie stops to pat a baby dinosaur, and they somehow even manage to make this puppet look worse than the originals. This animatronic puppet looks like a kid's toy. Put it side by side with some examples from the first movies, and it's an undeniable downgrade. Back to Maisie and her caregivers, she runs away telling Claire that she can't keep her locked away forever, she can look out for herself. She immediately gets kidnapped by some business lady, assisted by an O'Driscoll. They also kidnap Beta, and Owen then promises Blue that he will get Beta back. Blue somehow understands him. Again, I'm not kidding, he uses the words, I am gonna get her back. I promise you that. The movie has a self-aware moment with Ian questioning this. I made a promise we would bring her home. You made a promise to a dinosaur. But you are not forgiven, movie. Just because you acknowledge that it's silly, it doesn't make it any less silly. Ay, uh, well anyway, Claire calls Franklin as he now works for the CIA, and can therefore help find Maisie. He takes a massive risk to his job by telling them that the O'Driscoll boys are doing deals in Malta, and so that's where we'll be heading next. The CIA are also aware of the locust problem, as the guy next to Franklin explains that the majority of the crops worldwide will be eaten very soon, leaving most of the world starving to death, and he doesn't seem phased at all by this. As a guy who clearly loves his food, you'd think he'd be a little alarmed. That's not me fat shaming by the way, I'm a portly gentleman myself. If I was this guy, I'd be freaking out, storing donuts in my cheeks like a friggin chipmunk. <laughs> In Malta, Maisie meets one of this movie's temporary antagonists, whose name isn't important. She looks like she's modelling for Zara, so let's just call her Zara. Claire and Owen reunite with Barry. He was the guy helping Owen to look after the raptors in Jurassic World. It was good to see another familiar face who isn't a horrible character. Barry is now the CIA's inside man, who guides Owen and Claire through the Mos Eisley Cantina. I mean the shady dinosaur market. 
Speaking of Star Wars, this movie has its own version of Han Solo, who deals with trafficking dinosaurs and stuff. Claire pushes her for information, hearing her American accent, hoping that she can help locate Maisie. As we saw earlier, she does have information, but she tells Claire that she can't get involved until the movie tells her to. The O'Driscoll boys get new shipping commands from Zara. She has some atrocity raptors, which follow commands using a laser pointer. Laser marks the target, they attach to the scent, don't stop till it's dead. Inescapable. <laughs> Oh boy, here we go again. I so wish I was joking here. But yes, they're carrying on this stupid idea. I do like that the movie's introducing a new type of raptor, rather than making up another new dinosaur again. Turns out, one of the O'Driscolls was CIA, and they move in to close down the operation. But they manage to split up and scatter before any arrests can be made. Owen tracks one of them down to the market, where the guy tries to set Owen back by releasing a Carno and Aloe. Owen keeps them at bay for a second using his special hand technique, which apparently is effective on all kinds of dinosaur now, not just the ones that he trained to respond to this signal. Oh, whatever. The two guys end up in a fighting pit, and some men choose to hang around to place bets and cheer on. All the while, there's two massive carnivores in the background, stomping about and eating people. <laughs> nope, not one person is bothered by this. This level of stupidity really hurts my soul. I hate this movie. Zara orders the bad guy to release the atrocity raptors. And okay, I'm willing to admit this part isn't bad. <laughs> These atrocity raptors look much scarier than velociraptors. And you do wonder if Barry's going to make it out alive, as he's not a main character protected by plot armor. He does survive, by the way, and then he arrests Zara. Arrests Zara. <laughs> That's a tongue twister for me. As she's being detained, she sneakily points the laser at Owen's back, and so we begin our first chase scene. It's fine, I suppose, but this moment of the chase scene is absolutely not fine. <laughs> See anything wrong with that? <laughs> what the hell is this guy doing? Riding his stupid little scooter in between these two massive dinosaurs. For God's sake. Did anyone shooting this scene give a single shit about it making sense? Claire is also a part of this chase scene, but for her it started out on foot as she parkours her way across the city rooftops. <laughs> Do I even need to say more? I don't believe I do need to say more, but I'll play this clip just to make sure you understand. <laughs> Luckily, they all managed to rendezvous at the airstrip, where Claire opens up the back of the plane to allow Owen to do a cool action movie jump stunt. <laughs> Captain Hannah Solo wants to take them to Biosyn, as it turns out that's where the bad guys took Maisie. You willing to risk your life for people you never met? You want to ask questions or you want to ride? A good question for another time. Dr. Wu, who's still permitted to mess around with genetics for some reason, tells Maisie about her mother. She was a brilliant scientist and learned how to reproduce asexually, just like Blue. And that's why her and Beta have been kidnapped, so Biosyn can study their DNA. With the additional reason that Maisie's mother altered her DNA so that she wasn't born with the same genetic disorder. Are you feeling like bored Rick Grimes yet? Please keep watching, you're so close to the end. Dr. Wu says if he can learn the same skills as Maisie's mother, he'll be able to correct the mistake he's made. What kind of mistake? The good doctors meet with a Biosyn guy named Ramsey Cole, who gives them a tour of their building. He tells us that Biosyn wants to be different from InGen by not messing around with genetics and making pure dinosaurs with feathers and stuff. Well, he's half telling the truth. They meet with legacy character Lewis Dodson. Dodson? 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 We've got Dodson here! Yeah, that guy. Well, not quite that guy. The original actor did something very terrible, so now he's played by this bland bowl of porridge. We are unlocking the true power of the genome. We're this close, believe me. But hey, at least he's not a diddler. 
Honestly, this version of Dodson, who I'm gonna call Dolson as he has the same energy levels of a mortician, soon becomes another one of this movie's antagonists. Do you have food? Like one of my bars, Harden? Um, no, never mind. I'll, I'll, I'll find something. Such charisma. I can't wait to see more of Dolson. As is to be expected, he's the one secretly behind this locust plan. Ian Malcolm's back, because why not? Now we get to see all the gang back together. I just hope no one says anything cringy to ruin the moment. Do you two talk a lot? Uh, he slid into my DMs. He did what? <sighs> yes, because Gen Xers are well known for adopting social media lingo into their everyday vocab. Every time I call my mum, she's all like, what's good, son? I got some major drip for my birthday, and we got some Uber Eats to deliver some Maccas because I'm too lazy to drive. It was bussing. God, I hate this movie. Malcolm times the spilling of his secrets with the noise of a coffee machine to say that he knows all about the locusts and what Biosyn is planning. He sneaks Ellie a special wristband that gives them access to the secret lab. What a great idea it was, giving someone who is famously against messing with genetics and has given many public speeches about it, a wristband that gives you special access to the room where said genetic messing takes place. Ramsey explicitly told them that one elevator is for guests and this other elevator is strictly out of bounds because this one takes you to the super secret rooms. So please don't use that one when my back is turned. Sub level six. Restricted. Oh, you guys. <laughs> because we shouldn't care about spoilers, it turns out Ramsey is a whistleblower. And when we find that out, it makes sense why he would make this oops, I shouldn't have told you that moment. Henry Wu accidentally leaves the key that unlocks Beta's cage in the same room as Maisie. So of course she sets her free. <laughs> what the? Dolson sounds the alarm, which wakes up all the locusts that Ellie is trying to extract DNA from. They just about manage to escape with their lives, bumping into Maisie in the hallway because she too is able to just wander around this building without any hindrance from security. If this building even has security, I have my doubts. Maisie. Anna Solo radios the Biosyn control room and they deny her permission to land, with Dolson aware of the unauthorized people aboard. Hannah Solo then blackmails the controller into giving them permission. You do not want me to start spilling secrets, Denise. You remember Dubrovnik. It's different, Denise. Why did you react like this? You're wearing a headset, so Dolson wouldn't have heard what Solo just said. And if that's not the case, then why even use this headset? Shut off the ADS. Be sure. Uh -huh. Wow. Wow. Such great line delivery. You can really understand his mindset with this non reaction. Let's see it again in slow motion to really appreciate the performance. Be sure. It's the perfect blend of yes, no, maybe, I don't know, and could you repeat the question? You sure? <sighs> a Quetzal Coatlas, not saying that again, attacks the airplane. But strangely, this particular plane has an ejector seat. Only one ejector seat though, and it's not for the pilot. There! Get you off this plane. Even though this type of plane had no ejector seats IRL, I wouldn't have been as bothered by this if the ejector seat was for the pilot. I just can't imagine an emergency situation where the only ejector seat you need is for your second passenger. There. We gotta get you off this plane. What now? What? Well, anyway, this giant prehistoric bird just took down this giant metal bird. So Claire gets launched in front of a terrible looking green screen, while the other two brace themselves for impact. There's no way they came out of this alive, right? The plane practically nosedived into this thick sheet of ice. They went from moving at a considerable speed to almost an immediate halt. So they're at least in critical condition. 
Owen wasn't even wearing his belt, he just wrapped it around his wrist, <laughs> which would do absolutely nothing in this scenario. Oh, what's this? The hair and makeup are perfect. Not even a blemish, no bruises or cuts. They don't even appear to be shaken by the ordeal. <laughs> the plane looks like this, and they look like this. They could have made this plane crash the setting for an extremely tense fight for survival, but instead the movie chose the survival scene to be centred around this random pyro raptor chasing them as the ice begins to crack. It's not the worst choice ever, but it feels strange to move past the obvious and natural danger of this situation, only to introduce another. It makes this whole scene feel stuffed with nonsense, rather than focusing on the thing that you established in the first place. The plane has crashed into a lake of ice, a very dangerous situation. We don't need you for this scene, Pyroraptor. Fuck off. This standoff with the Pyroraptor goes exactly how you'd expect it to go, so I'm not going to waste your time because everyone knows they're going to survive this. Back to Claire, she's dangling like a bird feeder in front of the Therosinosaurus. Ugh. Another name I'm not saying twice. Admittedly, when I saw this dinosaur on screen, my cold heart melted, as for the first time in this movie, I felt a tingle of excitement. This claw bird was the stuff of nightmares for me and my friend Stuart when we played Ark Survival Evolved on Xbox. We spent forever trying to take down one of these giant claw birds that was attacking our base. It was equally as terrifying as it was exciting, and I wish I kept a recording of it, but luckily I found this clip on YouTube that perfectly captured why this dinosaur is so scary to me. I think the biggest, and perhaps the only legit compliment I can give this movie, is the visual design and sound design they gave Clawbird. That to me looks and sounds amazing. I'm not sure why they chose to make it partially blind, but let's roll with it. Luckily for Claire Deering, it finds this deer more endearing. Claire drops to the floor fearing that the end is nearing, and crawls into the murky lake disappearing. Claire is also blind now, and relies on her hearing to hear the claw bird's focus veering, giving up as it can't find Claire Deering. Unnecessary poetry aside, we have to take a moment to appreciate this part with the claw bird screaming. It was a cool visual, there's no denying that. Finally, security alerts Dolson to the shenanigans going on. He orders Ian Malcolm and Ramsey to be brought up for a telling off, and he shuts down the shuttle car that the others are trying to use to escape. Dolson reacts to the conflict with Ian with the expected amount of emotion that we've become used to with this pitter bread of a personality. That's it, huh? Nothing else to see here? Uh, I'm not sure I admire your tone right now. You need to leave. Yeah, I do. So, let's find out what happens with Alan's gang. They've conveniently stopped in a part of the tunnel where they can easily get out, but they're not alone down here. There's also a Dimetrodon lurking in the waters. I do appreciate this movie's effort in throwing as many dinosaurs at us as possible, but I won't let it distract me from this terrible screenplay. Speaking of which, there's so many characters to keep track of at this point that it's become a real nightmare for me to script out this recap. The movie keeps cutting to different people doing different things. We've got Ian and Ramsey making their exit plan, where they hope to find the others. We've got Alan, Ellie and Maisie dealing with the Dimetrodons. Then we've got Hannah Solo and Owen, hoping to find Claire but only finding a T-Rex and Giganotosaurus. And we've also got Dolson trying to delete files, knowing that he's about to be outed as a criminal, and so he sets fire to the locusts. Yeah, we're skipping a considerable chunk of this, because my brain is numb. I just want to be done with this franchise. Claire comes face to face with some Dilophosaurs, but then Owen chokes one of them out. Oh yes, choke me daddy. I'm your little dilofo whore. Ian accidentally rolls the escape car down a hill, but everyone is fine and the gang are back together. 
The Giganotosaurus arrives on scene and everyone is scared because this is supposedly the new apex predator. Giganotosaurus. Biggest carnivore the world has ever seen. To the best of my knowledge, this is a heavily contested fact. There seems to be no consensus on which was bigger, the Giganotosaurus or the Rex, but that's not really important. What is important to bear in mind though, is that for this whole movie we've been building up to the idea that the Giganotosaurus is the new threat, and despite that, even when it gets a moment to chomp down on our heroes, it pauses just long enough for Ian Malcolm to distract it with a flame tipped poker. I'm not kidding, the Giganotosaurus does not kill a single thing this whole movie. And no, the T-Rex in the prologue doesn't count, because that's not part of the main narrative. Editor's note, it kills one locust, one measly little locust that was already dying from being on fire. Just jumping in before you jump in the comments, because this also doesn't count in my books. With so many characters at our disposal, one of them could have made a noble sacrifice, especially when you consider that this is supposed to be the last Jurassic movie. God, I pray it's the last. Dawson watches over the park as the fire-coated locusts torch the forest, and before accepting the evacuation orders, he has a legendary level meltdown. God. Damn, Dawson went to beige alert. He got so heated, he almost had to take off his cardigan. <laughs> oh god, we're so near the end. And yet, it feels like a marathon left to run. So the next part of the mission is to turn on the air defense system, but to do this, they need to switch off some other stuff so they can redirect the power. And oh, for god's sake, the team's about to split up again. Ellie and Claire go to the server room to shut that down, which also shuts down the escape pod that Dolson's using. No. No, 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 no. Here are the nominees for performance by an actor in a supporting role. No. No, 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 no. Elsewhere, the gang tracks down Beta, and then this happens. Hey! Oh... Uh, this is stupid. This would not work. Owen had to go through trial and error to learn how to handle the raptors, and also earn his place as their alpha. You, Maisie, are not in a place of authority here. This raptor barely even knows you. This raptor would at best ignore you, or lunge forward and kill you. Furthermore, doesn't it water down Owen's character to have this hand manoeuvre being a thing that everyone can do now? At least when Alan tries doing it, Beta lunges at him. And that decision alone saves this scene from being totally stupid. To cheer me up, this next scene is quite delightful, because it's Dolson being eaten alive by Dilophosaurs. What's your story? Ah! <laughs> he couldn't even exit with some decent dialogue. You're about to be eaten alive, and the first thing that comes to mind is... What's your story? I am so happy you're dead. Everyone's ready to go home, and then Dr. Wu appears from the shadows, begging for a chance to reverse the impact of the locusts. They all rush out to Hannah Solo's helicopter, but before they can get away, we have to witness a dinosaur standoff. To the movie's credit, the setup is kinda cool. Not only do we have the T-Rex and Giganotosaurus duking it out, but also Clawbird joins in to make it a two-on-one. The execution of this fight, on the other hand, is kind of silly. Oh wow, you can really tell these people are desperate to escape. Look at the speed they're sprinting. The battle is over before it even really feels like it begun, as Rexy pushes the Giganotosaurus onto Clawbird's claws. And that's the end of that. Couldn't even have the Giganotosaurus kill Clawbird, no? Wow, what an apex predator. <coughs> what was your favourite Giganotosaurus moment, chat? We get a voiceover wrapping up this movie's ending, showing Dr. Wu releasing a new locust that will kill all the other ones or something. Blue gets her baby back, very cute. And Blue gives Owen this look as if to say, cheers bruv. 
And then we see a variety of dinosaurs living in harmony with their modern day relatives. You know that Mosasaur is going to devour those whales. Hang on, this is going to be bad. And yep, that's the friggin end, ladies and gents. It really does bring me pain to see this franchise go down like this. For this last movie, I know it must have been frustrating to hear me complain so much. I really don't enjoy being this negative, but based on all we've seen here, can you really blame me? If you disagree, I urge you to go watch the first movie again. Experience again the magic, the thought and care that went into that wonderful movie. When my son is old enough to enjoy it, I'm definitely showing him Jurassic Park. And the anticipation of that moment brings me so much joy. I want movies like this to be enjoyed by many generations to come. So together we can appreciate it for all it accomplished back then and for creating a community that carries on strong today. Despite the rocky road we endured towards the end. I want to thank you guys in my community for joining me on this journey and being extremely patient while I made this video. You guys on Patreon giving me that additional support helps me pay my way during the upload gaps. And for you watching this right now, I want you to personally know that I'm grateful. I'm so happy to have this project finished. I love you Jurassic Park. I hate you Jurassic World Dominion. Good night.